called the meeting to order. This is the February 26th regular meeting of the Planning and Zoning Board for the city of Tarpon Springs. Uh, Mr. Vesey, would you lead us in the pledge and the invocation, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I came prepared today for an invocation. I'm sure that all of us noticed how lovely the weather was. Mm -hmm. It appears that spring is here. <laughs> also judging from the amount of oak pollen in my pool. <laughs> spring also brings the season of Easter. And in the season of Easter, it also brings Lent. And of course, with our special community of Orthodox, Lent would bring Saracosti, which is fasting. It's also a period of self-denial, self-examination, almsgiving, and maybe personal reflection. I believe that we all could use some personal reflection, especially as we move into this new year. Thank you. Amen. All right, before we get into the purpose and mission, uh, there's a couple little things. First, to welcome our new member, Susan Swenson. Thank you. Who is over mm -hmm. here. Uh, we're happy to have you with us and look Thank forward you. to your contributions. Uh, also, staff would like to comment on the new agenda portal access system that that we're all being forced to use tonight. <laughs> right. um, just Got wanted it. to find out: was everybody able to access the portal? No. Yes. Okay. Yes. I yeah. didn't have access to a computer. I'm having some trouble with okay. the internet. Okay. Right and now. I do have a couple of hard copies. If somebody really needs one tonight. Um, but if you do need assistance on that, we can, we can, you know, if anybody wants like a, 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 a screenshot tutorial, anything to walk you through that, we can assist you with that going forward. This is our first uh, try. We think you're really going to like it. We like it. Uh, you'll be able to just pull up the individual documents that will be very, very fantastic for the public because instead of this big PDF you know, a 300-page PDF packet, they're going to be able to click on documents, look at the stuff, and, and I really think it will be great. So hopefully, um, if everybody has it available, I'll go ahead and give uh, Mr. Couscous a paper copy. Anybody else want a paper copy? I'm having some issues. So. Okay. All right. All right, and since we have a number of members of the public here, I'll briefly go through our purpose and, and mission. Uh, thank everyone for attending the Tarpon Springs Planning and Zoning Board. The purpose of the Planning and Zoning Board is to conduct public meetings on the items that come before it. The Planning and Zoning Board has reviewed the evidence in the agenda packet for each item on the agenda this evening including the application materials in the staff report. The board will consider that evidence along with any new evidence or testimony that's provided at the public hearing. The board will consider all the information provided to us at this hearing in accordance with the quasi-judicial procedures by which we're bound. I will ask the city attorney to explain these quasi-judicial procedures at the appropriate time. This board uses these procedures to judge whether the application meets the intent of the city's adopted comprehensive plan, future land use map, and whether the application conforms to the city's currently adopted land development code and zoning atlas. The board will render a decision on each item in the form of a recommendation to the board of commissioners who will take the final action on the item. 
The general hearing procedure for each item called by the chair is as follows. Staff presentation first, followed by applicant presentation, affected party presentation, should there be any, public input, staff and applicant rebuttal, and finally board motion, discussion and vote. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Seaman. Here. Mr. Kuskudis. Here. Mr. Vesey. Here. Mr. Zimbellis. Ms. Francis. Here. Mr. Rockline. Here. Ms. Early. Here. Ms. Swenson. Here. All right. Uh, that brings us to a brief announcement of a change in the agenda. Application 22-112, Ordinance 2024-01 which was an amendment to the land development neighborhood conservation overlay is deferred to a date to be re-advertised. So that one won't be addressed tonight. That brings us to the approval of minutes of previous meetings. Tonight we're addressing the May 15th, 2023 minutes. Uh, I need uh, a uh, motion in a second I'll, and then we can discuss if we need to i'll go ahead and motion to approve the minutes can we ha or is there any discussion that anyone has on that item i just have a quick question for council if if i could i was not present physically for that meeting but i did have the opportunity to review it the day after <clears throat> should I abstain or no you should still vote on the item and you can always do that even if you're absent for the meeting that it pertains to because you're approving it as a public record of the city thank you all right uh, if there's no further discussion can we have a roll call miss <clears throat> Swenson miss early yes mr. Rockline yes miss Francis yes mr. Vesey Yes. Mr. Kuskudis? Yes. Mr. Suman? Yes. All right. That brings us to item number five. They're trying to make me say quasi-judicial more times than ever before <laughs> uh, without screwing it up. Uh, quasi-judicial announcement and swearing of speakers. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the matters before the City of Tarpon Springs Planning and Zoning Board are quasi-judicial in nature. In a quasi-judicial quasi proceeding, the board's function is to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the City of Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances. This is a legal decision regarding the application before the board. The board may only consider evidence that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues arising from the application and the applicable code sections. If the evidence demonstrates that the application meets the criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances, then the board is required by law to grant the applicant's request. If the evidence demonstrates that the application does not meet the code criteria, then the board is required to deny the applicant's request. Any and all persons providing testimony at this hearing are required to do so under oath. All persons testifying at this hearing must give their name, address, and must indicate whether or not they have been sworn for the record prior to proceeding with their testimony. All testimony and questioning at this hearing must address matters that are relevant and material to the application pending before the city's planning and zoning board. <clears throat> Any board members who have disclosures, such as ex parte communications or conflicts of interest, please make your disclosures at the beginning of the hearing. The following is the established procedure which will, will be followed at this quasi-judicial hearing. First, staff will present its testimony and and evidence regarding the application and the applicant will have the opportunity to ask questions and cross-examine city staff and any city witnesses. The applicant will then have the opportunity to present their witnesses and evidence and the city will have the opportunity to cross-examine the applicant and any of the applicant's witnesses. Then members of the public opposing and in support of the application will be given the opportunity to provide their testimony and evidence. Finally, the applicant and then the city may present any rebuttal testimony and evidence in a closing statement for summary. Then the board will close the public hearing for consideration and a decision. At this time, anyone who's going to be speaking at this hearing, please stand to receive the oath. <clears throat> Raise your right hand. Do you all solemnly swear to tell the truth on the matters here before the City of Tarpon Springs Planning and Zoning Board this evening? Please remember to state your name, address, and indicate that you've been sworn prior to proceeding with your testimony. All right. Uh, 
and it does mention down here about the speaker time limits. I think we've we've got enough going on tonight. We do need to stick with those time limits. Yes, those will be four minutes each. Right. All right, that brings us to item number six on our agenda, application 23-122 and 23-123, uh, and resolution 2024-06. It's a conditional use approval and site plan approval for property located at 512, 514, 515, 516, and 520 Island Drive and 520 Hill Street. And this is a quasi-judicial item. Uh, does I, the staff I have to make an announcement before the presentation um, I have represented the applicant in, in other matters not in this particular matter um, I don't know if that would uh, put me in a position of disqualify me on this particular case um, in accordance with the Florida bar rules um, would there be any conflict of interest with respect to the current matter I've, since I've not been participated in, in any of the discussions or development with this, um, I don't think it would put me in conflict with regard to this, but I will leave it, you know, the, the optics are that, that I've represented uh, uh, Turtle Cove or the space and other matters. So, <laughs> so with the respect to those other matters, would anything regarding a vote on this one way or the other inure to your financial benefit or no. loss? No. <laughs> Okay, and did any of your representation pertain to this particular parcel or parcels in any way, shape, or form? Except when he purchased them many, many years ago, but that has nothing to do with the, what the intended use is. So it was just the original underlying purchase? purchase. Correct. Okay. And just to be clear, um, Time of the purchase was the zoning and land use at issue? No. Okay. Are you still able to make a fair and impartial decision based on the testimony and evidence that's yeah. going to be presented here today? I believe I can. <clears throat> Other than a review of the sale documents, would there be any for full disclosure, I've not looked at any of the applicant application presentation that's been submitted until just now. Okay. All right. But you can still make a fair and impartial decision based I, on the testimony and evidence that's presented here today. I believe I can. I, I represent a lot of people in this community who have appeared before this board and, and, and has not dissuaded me one way or another in my decision making. And at the time you represented, were you on this board? No. All right, uh, does the staff have a presentation for us? Uh, yes, Allie Keene, Principal Planner with the Planning and Zoning Department. Uh, this application is again a conditional use and site plan review um, under resolution number 2024-06. Uh, the property in includes several different parcels on both the north and south sides of Island Drive, um, totaling about 1.3 acres in size. The current future land use of this property is CRD, which is the Commercial Redevelopment District. This particular land use is the land use designated for all of the properties within the city's special area plan. Uh, specifically, this property is located within the Sponge Docks Character District of the special area plan. Uh, the zoning of the property, it falls under the regulations of the SMART Code, so it is in the SDC, Marine Industrial Commercial Transect Zone. The applicants are requesting conditional use approval to allow a seasonal short-term rental facility. Specifically, this is a boutique motor coach resort or an RV park on the subject property. Um, according to the definition of the SMART code, it falls under that category of a seasonal short-term rental facility. And the big distinguishing factor of that is the maximum amount of um, stay for a particular unit on that um, property under a seasonal short-term uh, rental definition is six weeks or less. They are proposing a total of 16 RV parking pads or lodging units. Um, the site improvements include a drop-off area on Island Drive, landscaping, fencing, and other site improvements. Uh, the facility will be managed and overseen by the existing Turtle Cove Marina offices. 
um, and the general manager will handle any sort of guest issues that arise during a guest stay. Uh, staff will assist all guests with check-in and out, parking as well as setup of their vehicles. Uh, the property will be gated, so they will only be accessed by guests and staff. The subject properties are shown here, outlined in yellow. Again, it encompasses several different parcels um, in this area on the north and south side of Island Drive. Um, it is within the SDC transect zone. Um, the special area plan boundary is the red data, dotted line you see here. Outside of the special area plan is the Turtle Cove Marina, which is in the WD1A Waterfront Development District. And then across is the Stamus Yachts um, uh, facility in the WD2 Waterfront Development District. This is a look at the existing uh, future land use within the area. Again, all properties within the special area plan fall within the CRD, which is this very light blue area, um, future land use category. Um, outside of the special area plan is the CGF, Commercial General Fishing District, and then the IG, Industrial General District. This is a look at the current conditions on the property. The site does include or encompasses the existing Turtle Cove Clubhouse here, as well as the pool and a portion of the parking lot. Um, all of those facilities and amenities will be available to guests that stay at this facility. Um, there is an existing single family home still, I believe, on this parcel and this parcel. The um, former single family residences on these two parcels have been demolished over the years. Um, those two homes would be uh, removed in order to develop the facility. And just for some context, the Turtle Cove Marina is located just here to the south. This is a look at the site plan. It's kind of small here on the screen, so I'll try to walk you through it um, a bit. All of the improvements will take place on the parcels to the north here and to the south. The existing clubhouse and parking lot and pool will remain as is. It's just, again, being um, utilized by guests of the facility. There will be eight parking um, places on the north side as well as eight on the south side. Um, of the facility. They are proposing to have a drop-off area on Island Drive. This is where guests um, will come and pull off the road so they do not impede any sort of traffic circulation on Island Drive, and staff members will assist them to get set up um, at the resort. They are also proposing to fully fence in the entire facility with a black wrought iron aluminum fencing, um, and they'll also be incorporating some landscaping. Um, shown here, um, the landscaping plan meets all of the required um, standards of the SMART code, which includes landscaping along the frontages, around the perimeter. Um, they're utilizing a mixture of different shade trees and palm trees, as well as hedges. And then I forgot to mention, they also are required and in, are installing sidewalks along Island Drive on both sides of the street. The applicants did provide an exhibit within their site plan application uh, package showing site circulation. This is just showing that um, the various sizes of motor coaches can circulate safely um, in and out of the site. Um, so this shows the circulation patterns and how they can maneuver without impeding the right of way as well as other parking um, pads in the facility. The site plan uh, request comes with two warrant requests by the applicant. The first is in regards to parking. Uh, typically, the SMART code requires one parking on-site parking space per lodging unit. Again, they're proposing 16 units, so they would technically need 16 parking spaces on-site. The applicants are proposing a total of 13 dedicated on-site parking spaces, and that will encompass um, eight parking pads here that will be extended so they could accommodate a motor coach that has a tow-behind vehicle. And they're also proposing to um, dedicate five spaces in the existing parking lot at the clubhouse um, that would be signed and specifically for the use of the um, resort facility. Uh, so during the review of this, staff does believe that this is kind of a unique lodging uh, use and one, one parking space per lodging unit is probably not typical or needed. Um, many of the customers, according to the applicant, do not provide or bring any uh, personal vehicle with them. Um, but another consideration was the existing parking lot for the clubhouse has additional parking above the required amount for the existing clubhouse and marina and with the five spaces. So if we ever needed additional parking for this facility, it could be accommodated on site. The second uh, warrant request is in regards to a street, street screen. Uh, the smart code requires a street screen to be installed along the frontages of Island Drive here. And a street screen must be a wall unless a fence or hedgerow is approved by warrant. 
Uh, the applicants are requesting to use a hedgerow and trees along the frontage with a combination of a three foot tall wrought iron fence. Um, staff does believe that this proposed screen does meet the overall intent of the smart code. Um, and additionally, by having a, a, a non opaque uh, screening with the fence as opposed to a wall, it could help improve visibility and circulation along the street as well as on and in and out of the site. There are a few considerations that we looked at during the review of this application. Uh, first is in regards to context. As you all are aware, this is a mixed use area. There is retail, restaurants, marine related industrial uses, parking, and residential uses all within a very close proximity. Uh, this particular site is buffered from nearby residential uses by the existing uh, Turtle Cove Clubhouse as well as the marina. This site is also located off of the main thoroughfare of Dodecanes, uh, but it is within walking distance to the tourist destinations of the sponge docks, so it does not necessita necessitate guests to get in a personal vehicle to go to the destinations that they're here to visit to go see. The next was trip generation and circulation. According to the ITE uh, manual for trip generation, this use generates very, very low trip uh, volume as well as very few peak hour trips. It's less than one uh, trip per occupied campsite. Um, and again, the location minimizes the need for guests to use their separate personal vehicle to go to the destinations they're here to, to see. Um, the applicant has also demonstrated that the RVs are able to safely navigate to and maneuver in and out of the proposed project site. Next is the Sponge Docks Character District. Again, this is within the special area plan and that character district is primarily comprised of tourist oriented commercial businesses, restaurants and industrial waterfront uses. There is a specific objective within the special area plan that states that uh, we should be providing tourist accommodation options such as hotels, motels, inns, and other short stay lodging within walking distance of the tourist destinations of the sponge docks. So although this is proposed project is not your typical logical um, facility, it is a type of use that provides necessary short stay accommodations in a relatively small scale um, within walking distance of those destinations. Uh, the last item is in regards to future development. Uh, this particular project does not necessitate significant site improvements. Um, so therefore in the future, it could really be easily redeveloped into something more uh, permanent if necessary. The applicant provided with their application a few example photos. This is a similar facility elsewhere in the state of Florida, just to give you an idea of what they're looking to do. There's some more photos provided. Um, looking at your conditional use criteria, staff does believe that all these criteria have been met. I'll quickly read through those. Um, one, the project does conform with the applicable standards of the SMART code. Uh, the project is compatible with mixed use area and supports the overall intent of the sponge docks. It also provides the short stay accommodations to support the existing businesses of the sponge docks. Uh, the use is consistent with the comprehensive plan and special area plan. Uh, the project is not proposed on an environmentally sensitive site. It's not located within the historic district or the Greektown National Register District traditional cultural property. Uh, the general area is mixed use and the site is buffered from nearby residential by existing developments. We do not believe that it will adversely affect adjoining property values. The proposed use will not impact nor exceed the capacity of the city to provide public facilities to the area. Um, the proposed project is developing um, some underutilized parcels within a developed area, and the, there are existing utilities to serve the proposed use. And lastly, the proposed project is not expected to adversely impact the general health, safety, and welfare. With regard to the site plan, these are your uh, four criteria to review. Uh, the site plan was reviewed by the Technical Review Committee on several occasions um, and has been found compliant with all of our applicable codes and standards, including stormwater review. Um, and all of the details for these criteria are provided in your staff report. Uh, with that, staff does recommend approval of resolution 2024-06 of both the conditional use and site plan, um, including the warrant requested I went over previously. Uh, we do have a few conditions. The first is in ties to the conditional use request and that is the total number of RV parking pads or lodging units is limited to 16. Based off the size of the property, they could accommodate a few additional units. However, staff believes that 16 is sufficient for that particular um, area and project site. And then the site plan, we have our typical two uh, conditions, which the construction plans have to be consistent with the site plan approval, and the site plan will expire six months from the effective date if a building permit is not obtained. 
Uh, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. I have a, I have a couple questions. Okay. Um, is, is this location inside or outside the, uh, the Greek town? His it's outside of it. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, it's just on the border. Okay. And what is, is what's the nearest short-term RV park, uh, <sighs> or do we even have one in our city limits? Okay. Do we have an, an actual RV park within the city limits? A, a, a short term, like, like, or is a KOA, is that the one? Yeah, KOA is probably the, is the, the most similar, but that's a much grander scale. Is that within our city limits or? I don't think so. Yeah. There might be one, but I can't come up with one. Okay, so we, there's really not one? It's just over in no, the And within there, our city I'll limits. Look. I mean, if you don't know, just say. Yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not sure if there's one within the city boundaries. There are ones in nearby adjacent jurisdictions, yes. Okay. I have a question. How tightly are they held to the example photos? Because those photos are great. So the walkways and the grass. So these, they're provided as a part of the application. So this is giving you a recollection of what is to be seen on site. Um, it doesn't have to be exactly that, but substantially uh, similar. If they came through with something that was substantially different, we would say it was inconsistent with their site plan package they brought forward. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Yes. And I, it just, I just might be confused. I thought this was short term, short term? Mm -hmm. yes. Correct, yes. But then I saw they're doing, on page nine, they're providing extended parking pads. Am I looking oh. at this the wrong way? Is that wrong? Yeah, so the extended parking, they're extended just longer. In length? Correct, extended length. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, mm -hmm. I have more questions, but they can wait. I have a few questions, Ari. Um, I just wanted to verify the notices that went out. I'm unfamiliar with the, if the smart code has any more requirements because Although we've gone through the whole comprehensive code, we since I've been on the staff or the board, we haven't touched the smart code. So, is the requirement for the 500 feet the same? Yes, it's the same. And how many notices went out for this? Um, I can look that number up for you. I have if it. you could, I'd like to know that before the suit. Yes, I'll I'll grab it when the applicant is up. And I requested this before that 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 number be be ready because I've asked that at almost every wow. every meeting. So okay. it's it's really important that everyone's notified to make sure that they're here. So um, I just wanted to verify were there um, any concerns that the staff had about anything in this application? Well, the things that, that went over the considerations. Other than the, other than the conditions. Uh, well, the considerations that we went over, we looked at this project holistically uh, through the review. We've been working with the applicant for several, several months. They've gone to the technical review committee several times to address all sorts of items ranging from meeting code standards as well as meeting the stormwater requirements. We talked about <coughs> traffic circulation, the generation. We wanted to ensure that the RVs were able to safely maneuver in and out of the site without being on Island Drive. Re remaining we, concerns. I'm sorry? Are there any remaining concerns that are articulated no. in the... No, but you, what's in the uh, staff report um, covers our review, and there are no outstanding concerns, so aside from no, limiting it to the 16 units. So there are no concerns about the um, the, the warrants for parking is, is, is addressed by the correct. 16, correct? Okay. Correct, yes. Uh, no concerns about the street screening? No. Um, no concerns about the anticipated travel route from the R for the RVs that to take Dota Canis from a live oak. Mm -hmm around the roundabout to Roosevelt to Island Drive. Correct. There's, there no. are no concerns about that. No, and um, our public works folks reviewed the application as well, and we talked about the anticipated travel route. Um, the applicant will be communicating to their guests um, if they need to adjust that route for any certain reason. Um, staff's perspective is there are large delivery trucks, there are coach buses, there are RVs now that access that property and access Dodecanese. So we, and the roundabout size to accommodate those larger vehicles. So we do not have concerns. Um, and I'd like to know how the, um, the factors that were considered in number four were the conditional use will not result in significant adverse impacts to the environmental or historical resources. Um, what factors did you evaluate, did the staff evaluate to come to that conclusion? So the, well, the environmentally sensitive sites typically are, is for 
like wetlands and areas of those nature. This is not on a mapped environmentally sensitive site, so it does not address that. It is also outside of our mapped local historic district. It's also outside the boundary of the Greektown district, um, so it does not have that impact. Um, I we believe that it has significant buffering from existing development along that area, provides some pr protection, and also the sheer nature of what's being developed is, again, in the future it could be if something more permanent were to go into place, that could happen without major um, improvements being made, because this is really just aggregate improvements. Um, under the SMART code, again, I'm not familiar with it because we haven't touched it, um, are there any concerns for adversely affecting any commercial property values? No. No, this particular use from staff's perspective is providing a place for guest accommodations for overnight stays that can potentially benefit the businesses in the area. Can you remind me, when was the last time the SMART code was updated? The SMART code has been periodically o updated over the several years for but certain the last items. time? Um, I would say it was, 20, was it 2022. We did updates following the hotel discussion, adjusting some of the heights. Mm -hmm. um, but the SMART code was adopted in 2011. It's significant more or it's been, it's significantly newer than our land development code that was in 1990. What were the updates that were made in 2022? They were specific to the hotel heights and limitations. There was more specificity provided for above a certain height limit was a conditional use requirement as opposed to like an automatic allowance. Were you at the um, historic Greek town meeting at Rusty Bellies? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wanted to, to, you know, point out that there were some discussions um, Granted, they were provided by the consultant to the workshops at various tables. Mr. Spaeth was actually sitting next to me at that. Um, in some of the options for the um, interested affected parties to, to look at and evaluate if they were interested in was maybe eliminating curbs at the sponge docks, maybe even, you know, taking streets away. And, you know, I understand that sometimes there are is communication issues between separate committees and boards within the city, but this application, as you've said, has been going through TRC, so it has definitely been, you know, the staff has been aware of this application and these RVs and this being their anticipated <coughs> route, which you don't have any concerns about, um, you know, and it's just concerning to me being at that meeting two weeks ago, listening to a consultant in front of the, our staff propose eliminating curbs while also a couple weeks later listening to an application saying that RVs, luxury RVs, which are like the Mac Daddy RVs, coming down Dota Canese with possibly no curbs. It's so, very, it, it's extremely concerning that these different types of factors are not necessarily, um, you know, being considered by the staff together. Um, so I, I would say that that's not that's not an accurate portrayal. So yes, well, these I would say are that all, it is an accurate portrayal. So these, are, these the all are considerations. So yes, at the Greektown meeting, there was discussions about I'm gonna potential take a, no, no, options. I'm going to correct you on that. It's an accurate portrayal. I was at the meeting, so don't, please uh, okay, don't correct so me. Okay, so let's let the record of that meeting speak for itself. There was no record. It just wasn't yet, but that's... Okay, that's, well, let me just I'll, I'll try to answer your question, or at least provide a no, response no, 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 to your question. Nothing. Um, but in regards to say if anything were to change on Dodecanese traffic circulation wise, then this area, as you all know, has there are several streets. It is a grid system. There are other avenues to access the property, and there's other ways for a vehicle to get to this location. I agree. So it wasn't and that disregarded. That was being my next question was that I would think that there should be a traffic study because this anticipated route um, is. First of all, it, it, it looks to you. One anticipated route, there's no guarantee. I don't know how you would ever ensure that. I don't know how the applicant could ensure that. And I can guarantee you those, that an RV could not make those turns on the other roads. So I would, I would hope that the staff could do a traffic study. I saw the squiggly lines on the site plan that you showed before, and it just was not really convincing. These so. are engineered. Right. Yeah, well, I, again, it's not a traffic study, so I would, that's just okay. my recommendation. I'm just, just okay. I'm asking my questions. Um, I would, you know, again, I'm concerned about the impact on Dota Canese of just the actual roads, the, 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 these huge RVs, which will all have at least one car because they're, do you know how close the, the nearest grocery store is? Publix, Winn-Dixie, there's several. No, but I don't know about how close is it to this location? I think two, two and a half miles. Right, so they're going to, how do you anticipate that they're going to travel there if most of them will only, will not have a vehicle? I, I can't answer that question. All right. 
And then the six week stay, and this could be a question for the applicant. Um, do you, does the staff have any idea how that would be enforced? So that's the, that's the definition of short term seasonal rental. If there is a complaint that there's an RV there that's extending that stay, then the code enforcement could be involved. I know in discussions with the applicant, he's also talked about putting it in their um, documents for these days of maximum length of stay, but that is how they could operate. If there someone there parked there for several months at a time, that's not permit, permissible under this use, and they would have to have code enforcement. So it would be a code enforcement problem? It, it could be, yes. <clears throat> that's all the questions I have, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the number of postcards was 47. Thank you. Was that Pat? I'm sorry. 47 postcards. No, thank you. Thank and you. For the record, you have been sworn as well, correct? Oh, oh. Hmm. You've been sworn. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, thank you. I assume the drainage has to be blessed or, or maybe has already been blessed by uh, either DEP or the Water Management District, whichever one has jurisdiction in this particular yes. case? Yes, so um, the site plan was fully reviewed by our stormwater consultants and it is com found compliant with our requirements and they'll be required to obtain all of their uh, necessary documents from the water management district. And that's double verified in the permitting stage. Right, so mm -hmm. that that hasn't been completed yet, but it would have to before they pull the actual the, the stormwater management review has been completed. Um, we verify once they submit construction plans that it's still compliant, so there were no changes made in between. Mm -hmm. um, so that takes place at the permitting stage, and then they have to provide their Swift Mud, um, which is the modern man management district, um, documentations at that time. Yes. I join her concern about these massive RVs going up and down Dota Canise and making that roundabout. And obviously, you know, I don't, I've never driven an RV, but it seems perilous to me. And there's so much foot traffic, particularly down in that roundabout. Um, I, it's very concerning to me. And I guess I have another question about these RVs and I, I don't know RVs. so. If it's summertime and an RV is placed there and they have they want to run their AC, is the engine running or is that totally separate? Do you know? I, I don't know. I, I would defer to the applicant um, on how those operations work. Um, I'd also defer to the applicant to maybe expand on the actual circulation and getting to the site. Um, he provided us his, his assumed route that they would take, but there's other avenues. Um, and again, like when staff was reviewing this, we, we looked at what operates, you know, there are there are trucks, there's coach buses, there's all different types of things. So yes, there is there's there's lots of people, there's lots of activity on on the street. Um, but in addition to, you know, accommodating the size of the vehicle, SAS perspective was also that it's it's a small facility that would have minimal traffic, minimal trips throughout the day. Well, one of the, the <laughs> concern actually that I was thinking about as well was the diesel fuels. The diesel fuels. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have 16 big luxury RVs running their AC off of diesel all day, all night, it's 90 degrees, diesel, I'm diesel fumes. They, I mean, that's a concern and I don't know how they work. They do, I, I, they do plug into shore power. Yeah. Okay, uh, so it's or, electric? Or land power, yes, they, they have Thank you. 50 Sorry. or 100 amp services just like a house does, basically. Okay. All right. And keep quieter than yeah. your neighbors. And then, but again, I'll, I'll go back to the diesel fumes because there is nothing worse than being behind a bus. <laughs> and all these people walking up and down Dota Canise, it's more diesel fumes. Okay, I have, I have a couple of questions. Wait, yes. I'm sorry, I don't know if you're back. Oh, no. okay. um, there are, currently there are some commercial warehousing, commercial manufacturing, whether it's, and, and do they not, or do you know whether or not they get semi trucks that come and go and deliver whether it's uh, a, a Halas Bakery, uh, uh, the, the fish market, they come yes. and go, and also uh, food, a, a large semis that come and deliver to the restaurants down at the Sponge Docks. Yes. And they, they particularly have to manage Dota Canese because that's the route that they come down. Mm -hmm. um, so would it be fair that there's already semis that come and go up and down Dota Canese that service not just the, the, the restaurants, the gift shops, 
the uh, 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 Rusty Belly's Fish Market, Hellas Bakery, and whatever else that may be going on down there. Would that be a fair statement? Yes. And fuel trucks that come and drop uh, fuel off at the fuel depots? Yes, there is. Okay. So Dota Cadiz is used by just more than cars. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, yes. And my question would also be, how many of these RVs have tag-along cars behind them? Because they're not running these RVs all the time. Some of these are large enough where they have a car they get in and they zip around to all these grocery mm -hmm. stores and everything Yeah, else, so. and I think the applicant can kind of talk about you know, the, the tendencies or um, the typical behavior of these types of guests. Um, but um, under our review, it was explained to us that not, not everyone tows a vehicle. Um, some do, um, but really the... Um, reason for this particular location is because of its walkability to destinations so that the car is not as necessary. Um, yes, you may need it to go to other places, but the primary destinations are within a few footsteps. I have a quick question, Ellie, if I yes. could. I know in the material there was a, a ton of stuff about stormwater management, mm -hmm. but as part of the uh, technical review committee, would, did you feel or was it examined that there's adequate potable water supply and sanitary drainage provisions to accommodate what could be 32 or 64 people, you know, at one time at, on this site, theoretically? Uh, yes, um, they are required to provide their facilities impacts, so the amount of water and sewage and all that's um, used for this facility, mm -hmm. um, those are reviewed by our utilities folks and they are found to be sufficient. If I could follow up on him a little bit, mm -hmm. I looked at the renderings, the, you know, of what it would look like all finished, and I saw a lot of real pretty grass. Mm -hmm. Uh, are they going to get reclaimed water? How are, who's going to who's going to water these trees or this grass? They're required to have irrigation. I don't know. I don't believe that there's reclaimed water in this location in this area. Um, so they'd be required to to irrigate mm -hmm. with potable water. If there's no reclaimed available or can be extended to that site, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had one more question and then a follow up. Um, is it your understanding or I guess in, is, is part of the, the narrative here that the short term six week RV people, <laughs> and I'm gonna clarify that statement in a second, are here as tourists for the sponge docks and that's where they will be frequenting for six weeks? So the short term definition gives a time frame. So short, to be a short term rental facility or unit, it's six weeks or less. That gives you your time. Um, after speaking with the applicant, the typical stay, length of stay for these uh, residents are usually three to four days at a time, um, and they're here to visit the locations that are nearby. So yes, some people may stay longer or less, but they cannot stay longer than six weeks. Well, I just want to clarify, and, and this has come up in our comp plan, um, and I want to revisit it and I, because of this issue, because I think there's a distinction between visitors and tourists, okay. and it's a great site for other reasons than the sponge docks. I mean, it's it's on the water there. I mean, obviously we know that. This, there's there's multiple reasons why people will want to stay there. We've had these discussions about hey, the sponge docks is a is a half a day destination, a one day destination. Whatever one of people say about that, it's definitely not a six week destination, and that's why obviously you know I think that came into your the staff's evaluation as far as the the car th situation as far that because that wouldn't be reasonable people are going to have a car with them on all of these um, RVs. So I just think that there's a distinction between visitors and tourists. And I think mm -hmm. that this t this lodging, this special lodging should be considered because, I mean, when there was a hotel which would bring tourists, we had, you know, the Merchants Association here. And I don't see them tonight. So there's definitely a distinction between visitors and this is not a critique or a negative but i think that that is a distinction that should be realized by the by the board as, as well as that visitors and tourists are not the same type of individuals there's other reasons to visit the area but we do have to consider i think as a board the impact on the tourism industry as well not to say that that they're, they're not entitled to their visitors as well but we have to to look at the same because they are in close proximity and that should be taken into consideration. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, further questions for staff? I have one. Is everybody else asked all their questions? Great. 
Ms. Keene, so good to see you. How are you tonight? I'm good, how are you? <laughs> so under the application and the short-term lodging that this would be provided by, would it be possible that the owner were at some point in the future to purchase and park their own RVs on these pads and let them out for short-term stays um, in more of an Airbnb or a, a Verbo or however that's done and kind of in a way using this kind of like a food truck service. So is that some is that a provision that could happen or would there be any built-in guardrails against that so as I applied? I would say based off of the application that's being presented today, it's intended for people to bring their personal RVs to the location and to take those away, not to have ones permanently there. If it were to change into something where there's something permanently at the site, I think they would likely have to come back through a process. Okay, so that, that's my question, mm -hmm. which is I understand the intent of the application today, but I can mm -hmm. see easily, and in fact, I kind of see it that way, that the ideal situation would be to buy four or five of my own they're for sale right now and park it on those extended pads or allow a, some other owner to park theirs for a continued and then sublet that out and turn those into just mini airbnbs so do we have any constraints as written into this application or within our smart code that would make sure that the intent and the spirit is actually enforced by law? So, so again, my, our interpretation of the, the application is that it's for personal RVs to come and go to the site. Um, I, the board could put a condition that's very clear um, to attach the conditional use if you felt that was necessary just to really uh, enforce that. Um, but I would say the interpretation of what's being presented today is they're not permanent vehicles parked on the site. And and that was a concern of staff as well. That's, we really talked about, you know, there's a six week time limit, what happens, um, you know, that is your cutoff. It's intended for short term stay. Now, if they wanted to come back in the future and, you know, go through a process to build little tiny homes on those pads to have more permanent places where people can come and do Airbnb, they'd, Airbnb, they'd have to come through this process again because it's a different application than what's presented to you today. Agree, because an RV is a tiny home, <laughs> a wonderful <laughs> one. So if, hypothetically, what verbiage would we include so that we just nipped that right now and made sure that all of the pads were always occupied by non-owners and were never allowed to be <clears throat> subletted. So um, ultimately you can't do that. There is an industry that does rent RVs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I'll use myself as an example. I don't have an RV, but if I wanted to, I could go and rent an RV the same way that I could rent a car and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then go mm -hmm. and, and put it there. Ultimately, because of the way that your ordinance is drafted with the six week limitation in it, the, um, the if any vehicle were parked there for more and because they are all registered, so that's an easy thing for code enforcement to track, mm -hmm. you know, and if there were any vehicle that were parked there for more than six weeks, it would be flagged and it would be it would result in a code enforcement action. So it would have to actually be reported so, um, or I mean, that would help, obviously. It, but, it okay. would. So, it would. I, I'm sorry. No, my, that, that was my question. Good, was my question. question done. Thank you very much. Yeah, but in, in order to maybe, uh, as a condition, uh, that the the rental, require that the rental agreement make specific reference that the, that the stays are limited to Spe six weeks. Make specific reference to it, it, towns yeah. or to the city's ordinance. Correct. Yes, you, if you wanted that, that to That would be a condition. That. A condition that yes, that, that, their, that whatever rental agreement they have in place reference the six weeks requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then you you could say something to the to the point of no vehicle. In addition to that, no vehicle may be allowed to stay in one of the spaces more than the six weeks, because as it is. <laughs> The people could change, but not the vehicle. But if you address by, address it by saying no vehicle can stay longer than that, you've kind of caught it both ways. I think so. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, 
I, I don't know if there's any more board questions. I actually had a question. Uh, so when I looked at this the first time, I actually mistakenly made the assumption that the Turtle Cove LLC and the SNN and Tarpon Enterprises Inc. were the same or related entities, but in looking at at SunBiz and all that, it appears that they are not. They're actually separate entities. So my question is with respect to the parking agreement, you're essentially giving them the five off-site parking agreements. Mm -hmm. Do we have a recorded easement for those five parking spaces or an easement that would be recorded assuming that this um, application were to be approved? Um, we don't have a separate easement agreement. We could request that as a condition yes. to be provided with the permit. Um, yeah, because I believe the property owner, he he's tied to both properties, but we can get an easement agreement just to make sure it's very clear. I, I actually, in looking at, and, and unless I have it wrong, I did not see that there was a relationship okay. between the individual company owners. Now that, that obviously that would be nice if the, there is a relationship that that could be cleared up, okay. but because it is very clear on the property appraiser's website that one, that that actually, you know, there's there's three parcels and I was kind of curious as to why there's not going to be a unity like of title. So they would all be as one in the, okay. the property owners, particularly where we're doing a site plan that's come, you know, based on a combination of, of all these properties. But the, um, Particularly, what I was I was interested in is the the aspect where you have an off-site parking mm -hmm. yeah. allowance, but that has to be memorialized in some sort of easement agreement that does get recorded mm -hmm. with respect to these properties in order for it to be considered to meet that requirement. Yes, okay. yes, we can request that. Right. Mm -hmm. We can add it as a condition. Mm -hmm. And Attorney Kardash, I'm not sure if, if you, on your research on SunBiz, if you found the Tarpon Turtle Cove Condominium Association as well. Just, I was a little confused. About I did. I did see that. That were neighboring. Those were neighboring properties that did not appear to have a relationship to this application. Um, I did, though, and part of the reason I probably thought that they were a related entity is because isn't the leasing office in the Tarpon Cove? Clubhouse, isn't that what I read? Yes, it's correct. Yes, <laughs> they're, they're all, they all operate together. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like some clarity on the record, particularly if the business entities no longer exist, then you have a site here that would no longer have a leasing office on site if whatever relationship between these two different entities no longer exists. Okay, the property owner is here, so he can probably provide a little bit of information, but we can okay. definitely add conditions for whatever type of documentation that you need. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Any further questions for staff? Since we have none, uh, would the applicant like to make a presentation? Uh, if so, approach the microphone, state your name and address and you're welcome to rebut anything that anyone has said or just make your presentation. Fair enough. Uh, Edward Spaeth, 847 Roosevelt Boulevard, uh, Tarpon Springs, and yes, I've been sworn in. Um, I'm more than happy to answer all of your questions, your concerns, and I'd like to kind of clarify this whole project a little bit um, and give everybody a better understanding of what this really is. So um, I do own Turtle Cove Marina. I do own the clubhouse, as well as all the SNN Tarpon Enterprise properties. Um, I purchased those many, many years back. Um, I've had four different people approach me about building restaurants. I've had people approach me about building hotels. Quite candidly, that property has sat there for vacant for many, many years, and I've looked to try to find something to do with it. Um, I've sat down with people. I'm not a developer. I'm a marina guy. I've looked at uh, people to build townhomes on it, um, different things, and with flood insurance, hurricanes, and all of this stuff here, it's gotta come to a point to where either I sell the land, which I've had the land up for sale for probably six years, and I think we all are finding this down here in Tarpon, um, especially on the sponge docks. If something were to end up happening to a building or a structure down there, we have very expensive pieces of property that somebody needs to be able to and build something on. I took the approach two years ago 
uh, during COVID to buy a motor coach and start traveling with my wife. I've visited many, many high-end motor coach parks. I can answer questions about tow behind vehicles, fifth wheels, trucks. I'm gonna go through the whole gamut of this. And any of your concerns, I'll be more than happy to answer. So with that being said, um, I did approach staff about it to say, would this be something that would be potentially doable down there? The way I looked at it is, as being a large landowner on the sponge docks, the walkability of the sponge docks is huge. People love to see the waterfront. Citizens don't want the waterfront blocked. So if I were to build townhomes or something on there, it would block the view. These are concrete or pavers pa pavered pads. I'm undecided on which I'm gonna do at the moment. Um, pavers are a maintenance nightmare. Um, they will settle over time. You'll get weeds growing through them. So more than likely it's gonna be concrete pads. As far as what the overall facility is gonna look like, I've got one opportunity building a boutique motor coach park to make a name and have people return. If they have a bad experience, my business is done, like in anybody's business if you have a small business. If I don't treat those people right and they don't have a good time here and they don't have first class amenities, which is why I'm using the clubhouse or swimming pool, which has not been open for three and a half years now because of COVID, nobody wants to come in and do anything. People have approached me about building a restaurant. I don't want to be in the restaurant business. My wife would kill me if I got in the restaurant business. I don't want to be in the restaurant business, but I do know that my marina patrons who are local and non-local people that come here and use their boat, use the sponge docks, and the way I view this is, it's no different than a transient boater coming and visiting my marina or coming and visiting the city's marina and getting off of their boat and walking the sponge docks. People coming by boat, maybe will stay three days, four days. People coming in these motor coaches are gonna stay three or four days. The rule of the thumb in the industry out there right now is these people travel with this motto of three, three, three. And that stands for they don't wanna drive any more than three hours to their next destination. They wanna stay three days and they wanna arrive by three o'clock. The majority of these people that have these RVs that we're talking about <coughs> are older people. They have discretionary income. They enjoy doing stuff. My wife and I have a big diesel motorboat, I mean, a, a, a motor coach. We don't pull a car. When we go somewhere, we've been to St. Augustine. We've been all the way up to Washington, D.C. to see Maryland. I meet a lot of people. We go, we Uber, or we'll catch a rail system going in and out of towns or doing something. So to some concerns about grocery stores and all of this stuff. These, whether it's a fifth wheel or it's a, a luxury motor coach, they have full-size refrigerators, they have washers, they have dryers, they have microwaves, they have ovens, they have heated floors. They plug in, they plug in. We are going to have shore power pedestals, 50 amp. There are sewer dumps that come right out that go in. So nothing is going anywhere. These are luxury items that people are traveling in today because people are more embraced in family and doing things as well as people when they go to these certain locations they have families or they have friends that maybe went to college or somewhere these are going to be people that are going to come down here and they're going to walk in every restaurant and every shop and they're going to spend their money and they're going to go i've driven as i said as far as washington dc in a 43 foot motor coach a diesel pusher tag axle, these things turn and drive like a car. It's not the old school, uh, what you know, uh, that RV movie with, uh, I don't know who the guy is, whatever, but these, these, these are not, these, these, are, these are machines today. It's like getting a boat, believe me, I have almost 500 boaters at my marina, and 
they may be able to afford a boat, but a lot of them may not be able to drive them sometimes. But today with technology, you have systems on a boat that you can basically steer it with a joystick. These buses have 15 cameras on them. They have guidance avoidance. They have everything you would want on them. I also thought about coming to my location. I drive up and down that sponge docks, and I have for 22 years when I came to this town and developed the marina. I drive it every day. We all drive by GPS today, and we listen when we drive, and, and it's saying go, 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 go. When I drive the sponge docks, I'm brake, stop, brake, stop, only because there are other vehicles that are slowing the traffic flow to get to my location. These buses are these fifth wheels have GPS and it's gonna say, continue here, 300 feet, 400 feet, make a left, it's gonna pull you in there. So as far as, as traffic going up and down, it's not gonna be any different than anybody else. With 16 coaches or RVs coming in, we are talking more realistically one to two a day. That is it. That's all that's going to travel that sponge dock area. Also with the flooding issue down there, between Roosevelt Boulevard when it was paved in front of the marina, going around to Island, my customers right now are driving very, very expensive high-end sports cars, SUVs. As soon as you turn off Roosevelt Boulevard and you go down on Island Drive, you're in water at high tide. Like I said, I have one opportunity to do it right. I've already talked to the city and the staff. I'm paving that road and raising it out of my pocket to make sure that I don't have a million dollar bus going into saltwater anymore and my customers don't have to drive their expensive cars in there. I'm a very particular businessman and I want things done right. So I'm gonna do it right the six week stay that is beyond what I even, I, that was brought to me. It is gonna cost somebody roughly $4,200 to $4,500 a month to stay on one of those paths. If you go to the KOA up here, it's $140 a night. If you wanna sit on the water down here, you're gonna spend $190 a night. Or would you rather stay here or here? It's like anything out there today. That facility will stay busy. It will bring people into the restaurants. It will bring people into the shops. They're gonna let people know if I do it right. And we're gonna have a lot of people down here. Scalloping's become a big issue down here right now. You know, all of a sudden we can scallop here. That'd be a great venue for somebody to bring their motor coach or something. They can dock a boat at the marina. They can go out with their family. They can stay the weekend. We have the festivals down here. You have the arts festival, you have the seafood festival. These people travel, they don't live in Pinellas County, they travel from out of the county. They come here in their RVs. You can go down there any given day and I have pictures until the cows come home. Everybody's parking on my property right now in RVs, they're down there. So as far as them coming down and doing, they're gonna come regardless. I'm giving them a safe site to enjoy Tarpon Springs and everything that it has to offer and the history. And if I want to change it one day, I can scrape the concrete off and decide to build something. It's, it's a simple way to do something with the property, clean it up, because I'm tired of hearing about code enforcement. I need to mow it to be candid, but all I do is mow grass down there right now and pay taxes. So. Uh, I'd answer any of your questions. I probably rambled on a little bit, I know. But, I, have, uh, I have a couple questions that sure. I wanted to address at first. Um, yeah. I, I've known you since you, you came to town, and I know that when you built the Turtle Cove, you were proactive in dealing with the fire department, fire marshals, about sure. everything, and I remember that distinctively about you. So I And I know you've had that property for a long time. And I'm glad that you said that. I'm unfamiliar with RV traveling in this 3-3, three, sure. three, this thing that you said mm -hmm. and I think that that would have been helpful in so what there is in the what, from what we have is all the, that they have right so sure. they, they have to put you in a category but there is a an option for a narrative and I don't think that that was necessarily maybe 
that would have helped us understand, I think, a little bit better about the actual proposed use. Because I said, I, I do know that you are, you've had this property a long time. You wouldn't just do this all of a sudden. You know, you didn't just come here last year and throwing this out here. So that would have been really helpful. And this is more of a note to staff. Um, rather than to try to make what you are trying to do into something that it is not, which is all we have to look off of. So if we can just see the six weeks, you know, that's all we're seeing. And that's, but as from you're saying, is that that's not even how it's gonna be. It's too expensive for these people to stay. And, and I understand, you know, what you're saying. And, and honestly, I have no issue with that. My concern obviously is still the travel thing. I don't think as Mr. Kuskut has said, it's comparable to our trucks that deliver things because those are necessary and that's always going to be an issue they come in the morning and honestly to the benefit of all of your um if that could be something you just say best to come before noon <laughs> on any oh. day just for travel and in, in general for because it sounds like it's not a necessary um the season these are seasonal but not necessarily by a certain season they're just because i know my clients a lot of my clients have RVs and travel, and that they time is not an issue for them. That they have all the time in the no, world. they're, they're so, yeah. a lot of them, a lot of them are retired. They yeah. they go. It's hard to um, tell somebody they can be here at a certain time though, right, because right. if they're but, if they're leaving Bradenton or Longboat, and you get on seventy five or you get on nineteen, and there's a wreck, mm -hmm. they they can't get here. So, um, but I mean, just as like that. I mean, honestly, I know where the location sure, is. Sure. It's, it yeah. is away from everything and I get it and um but again that my only concern really is that and I just you know with getting there and I just to make sure that th those are addressed that, that they're aware of those if they can't come the way that they're supposed to that they are aware of the other you know impair like the other roads that, they, that those are not roads that these big luxury like RVs can turn down. Well, it's, it's, it's a situation with, with everybody who has a business down there on the Deccanese right now. No, but yeah. what I'm saying is, is tied. I mean, I don't need the, my customers coming down here for the very first time who've never come here, and then they turn off or they come across Live Oak, go through the traffic light, and now they're in front of Dimitri's in, in a foot and a half of water. So the same way we have, we have a hump, right past Rusty Bellies, when we did a lot of transient business, there was a flat rock there. So we always asked our transient voters who came, what time do you expect to be at the marina? And if it was low tide, we warned them, do not come. Or slow up a little bit, come in, in two hours earlier or later, speed up. Same situation here. If there is a, a situation, and we know in the summertime when high tide is, I'm going to tell people to basically turn off a 19, come down Tarpon Ave, down to the bayou, around. They can get back in off road. It's easy to make a left-hand turn. It's hard to make a right-hand turn. Yeah. They can make a left-hand turn. They can go right down Roosevelt and pull in right past the marina and not even go down the sponge dock. So, again, I don't know. I, I think everybody here, if you see salt water, you don't want to drive through it. So, but... If you have to, you live here, it's one thing, but to, to have a guest or somebody come here and want to repeat and not a bad blog out there, you better put your best foot forward and make sure they don't go through salt water. So I'm going to be very, you know, observant about that and make sure that my staff knows, look, you know, it's like a tide chart. Here we have it. Just if these people are checking in on this day, let's make them aware of, send them an email and make sure and pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, listen, you know, you can leave a little later there, you can come in earlier, come in. So I, I understand your concerns. And so. how large are the parks that you've been going to the last few years? Very, very small. Um, I mean, I mean, excuse but, me. I mean, small, I mean, uh, nothing to the, to the size of this. I mean, I've been going to, I've been in parks that have been 1,500 sites. I've been in parks that have been 30, 40, um, nothing, nothing this small. The only thing I've, I've even re remotely, the, the examples that are in there is a marina called Yacht Haven down in Fort Lauderdale. Um, that was purchased by a marina group, uh, West Trek, actually, and they're developing that down there. Uh, when I went with my wife and my kids to a country music festival over on Fort Lauderdale, we stayed at that motor coach park. Um, and when I pulled up and I saw the wooden dock and I saw the waterfront and I saw the marina, I was like, a light bulb went off. Mm -hmm. My wife and I were like, well, we have this right here. We're trying to you know, shove a square peg in a round hole, 
it's that's when I came back and said to staff, would this be something that would work that would, you know, be, you know, aesthetically pleasing as well as allow me to move forward because my son's running, running my marina now. He graduated college with an MBA. I'm trying to do some other stuff and I'm looking, he doesn't want me to sell the marina. So I'm like, well, what am I going to do with this land? If I can't have a restaurant, I got to do something with it. So that's, that's where this just came up about. So, and yes, I have had the land for probably seven years. So thank you. I, I do have a, a few questions, Ed. Um, one of the questions council had addressed was using your, your current leasing office at the marina as the leasing office for this. But the, the clubhouse itself has its own office space, correct? Correct. So, so if you had to end up selling, let's say you sold the marina or whatever, change a different ownership, you, there actually is a place on site to have a leasing office on site. Well, the, the actual the marina itself in the has, clubhouse. Its, has its own has its own office. I know somebody brought up and mentioned something. I think it was um, yourself regarding Turtle Cove Condominium Association. That was the the craze and the raise back in two thousand six through eight. Um, I only condoed one part of that marina and sold slips there. I'm actually in the process right now, and the, everything's already the amendments have been. It, it's, that condominium association is being terminated. Mm -hmm. It's going away. So I'm still, I, I, even though I own the majority of the slips in the condo, I also own the mallets of the marina. Now it's just going to be totally me. The clubhouse is always me. s and Tarpon Enterprise I bought under a different entity at the time just because it wasn't associated with Turtle Cove. Now the landings of Turtle Cove is going to be kind of tied into the, to the whole development. But, if you, but if, if you had to, there's office space. Within. There's office space at the marina. It has nothing to do with the clubhouse. Right, but there's office, but space, there's office space within the clubhouse if you needed to have office space for a rental office. Correct. Necessary. Okay. Um, on these these motor homes, because you call this a, a, a high-end uh, uh, facility, uh, what's the average cost of these motors? Is it like, you know, up to a million dollars, some of these things that people are driving? Um, Probably the average out there today, I mean, they're a dime a dozen like boats. Okay. <laughs> when COVID, I would say things range. If you have a, a, a diesel pusher or something, um, you're talking 300,000 to 2 million. Mm -hmm. um, the, I, I know one concern was diesel exhaust fumes. Um, my forklifts at the marina, the two that I just purchased and every diesel vehicle Back in the day, you used to be behind a bus or you used to be behind a car and you stepped on the gas and you got hit with soot. Um, everything now runs on DEF, diesel exhaust fluid. Um, you could literally go to my forklifts or you could go to my diesel truck right now and it could run and you could put your nose right there and it doesn't smell anymore. So um, they're quiet. You hardly hear the, 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 the noise levels that these new engines from Cummings and things come out, they're, they're as quiet as your car is. Um, if you're going down the interstate at 75 miles an hour, yeah, you do hear it go by because of the turbos. But other than that, when they're just idling, they're quiet. So they're not, they're not noisy and they don't, you know, produce a lot of soot or they don't do anything like that. New ones. Correct. The, the new well, ones. yeah, but the, the same thing with that. I know that staff had had a, you know, I, I, I understand the perception. This is not a RV park where somebody's going to come abandon their abandon their RV at. It's the same situation where we don't, for what I charge it at the marina, nobody's going to come hide their boat from their bank there because it costs too much. And if you read my storage agreements, I don't hold, hold boats for bailed storage. I mean, quite candidly, if you don't pay me in the second month, there's already things in process that are trying to find out where this is, the bank. Same situation here. These people are not going to be abandoned in their 300,000 or million dollar vehicle on my property. So, I but, think, yeah. I think one of the concerns, and it, I just know this just from hearing, some people literally live in their RVs. They live there. They have to, they choose to, they live there. And I think that is a concern. Sure. And I, I, I see that it's limited, you know, six weeks, short term. And I think part of it, one of the things that we've all been talking about is policing that. Um, somebody has to pay attention, and, and I'm assuming it would be you, because um, you're going to want that person, maybe the next person, you don't want to get 
an ordinance violation or code violation, excuse me. I, is that you, you would pay attention? My, my staff or myself, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm there three, four days a week okay. at the marina. So, but, but yes, I mean, it's not a, again, this is, this is not, there, there are RV parks and there are a boutique motor coach park or there's a high-end motor coach park. This is what this is. I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not, in, in my agreement, same thing as, as at the marina, if your boat is too old, we don't even take it. We just won't even take it. So the majority of the places that I've visited with my wife, if you go in there, if, you're, if your RV or your motor coach is more than 15 years old, they won't even allow you on the property. So we're not going to be having uh, Yogi Bear and his like little jelly stone <coughs> coming down the sponge docks and dumping his old air, you know, airstream on that property that the tires are flat on. That's we're not even going to let them in. We have the right to deny them when they pull over there. If we see something that doesn't fit, because let's let's face it, if if, if you're in a million dollar bus and you have something that's offensive or doesn't look good, no different than my marina. There's not a guy that's going to be sitting in a, a 65 foot boat in a wet slip and then want some dilapidated boat with a, uh, you know, a household AC hanging out the side of it. It's just not going to happen. So you got to go. And and believe me, I've thrown many people out of the marina, and have been on the phone with the police department, and they've had to come down and said, you know, you got to go. You know, I'm, well, I don't have anywhere to go. Well, you can untie and you can go anchor. It's happened. So. And back to the parking spaces, is that, are those, those are not on your property? They are on my property. Or they are on your Correct, okay. yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Any other? Just to clarify uh, what Darla asked you with respect to it being on your property, it, although you own both companies, the properties are titled differently. So the five parking spaces, it, it was, is that a yes? Uh, the the S and N Tarpon right now currently Turtle Cove Group LLC owns the parking lot where the five five parking spaces are. Right. S and N Tarpon Enterprises is the is the the new development part of it. That entity is going to be going away, and it's going to be going into uh, the landings at Turtle Cove LLC. So, as far as if I need to put something, that's fine. But I mean, it's it's. Unity, I mean, I've done unity okay. of title with the, with the city about other, other stuff. If that's, I don't know what so we have to work with that. So. Here's what I would want for a condition with respect to this item okay. is if at the time he applies for his building permits, the properties are titled in the same name, whether it's the LLC, whether it's an individual, whatever it is, but the properties have to be in the same name. If they are not in the same name, then there has to be an easement recorded that is a permanent easement for those five parking spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would just add that the city has uh, required parking agreements in the past for this kind of situation, so it's not nothing new. All right, I kind of stated this before, but I just have one last question. Sure. I know you mentioned that you didn't want a restaurant, but in that you have one shot to make this work, but do you have any future plans if it doesn't work out to put a hotel there? No, not me. Just asking. I no. had to ask. No, I've been approached, believe me. And, I, just, uh, <laughs> I had to ask. I have no desire, no. I mean, nobody, nobody wants to pay me what the land's worth. I mean, let's that's, that's, that's face it, at the end of the day, they say they say they can't make the numbers work. Um, it would be the same thing as me coming in and putting $6 million or something in townhomes on the waterfront, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. So I'm... Regina said, yeah. I mean, if somebody fell on your property, it would be a disaster to sue you. Yeah. <laughs> But we would do it so, oh, with all those entities. Um, I, I do have a, actually a, a question too. It, you kind of got into a little bit about um, talking about the, the flooding situation Correct. in the area. Um, but what would your plans be for the property when there were hurricane evacuation orders? Is that something that you already have written into your lease agreements? It's it well in the at the marina we. We, we have something, okay. uh, you know, 72 hours or, you know, everything's changing now. The, the technology is getting way better. We used to not know. So um, all of these people, um, they're, they're very well tuned to, I mean, that's their baby. I mean, so at the end of the day, we're going to notify them that they have to leave. But I'll guarantee if they see an intimate storm coming this way, 
that they're going to be getting in and they're going to be going to Ocala or they're going to be going to Orlando. They're not going to leave their, their, their rig sitting down there. They're, they're going to get out of Dodge. So, yeah. All right. Any no further questions for the applicant? Uh, with that, we'll call for public comments then. You can be seated for now. Uh, do we have any members of the public here wishing to speak in favor of this application? Okay. Do we have any members of the public wishing to speak against this application? Neutral. Okay. okay. You're in the middle then. Okay. State your name and address. Yes, I'm uh, Carl Wagonfor. I've seen all you guys before. Uh, mm -hmm. Member of the Friends of the Anclote River. It's been a while since I've been in this room with you. But uh, if you could please give me the uh, laser pointer so I could use that illustration. Mm -hmm. And just for the record, you have been sworn, correct? I have been sworn. Thank and you, I sir. live at 98 South Island Avenue, Unit 401. Thank you. Um, let me say first that I'm a quite experienced RVer. I've been traveling for the entire summer since about 2008, with the exception of two years of uh, COVID. So I have a lot of experience with, uh, with not only RVing, but also towing. There's a term that you'd, you should know called TOAD, T-O-A-D, which describes whatever vehicle it is that you have hanging off the back of your motorhome. In my case, I have towed motorcycle on a trailer and a medium-sized SUV. Um, one of the things, uh, I, I see some flaws in the design of this, I think, but uh, I'm gonna try to limit my, uh, my criticism to those flaws that are gonna impact the traffic flow around the site. I think that's gonna be pretty, pretty damned important. There is a letter in your package from Northside Engineering, uh, which in speaks in generalities in general, but in the, the first sentence, more or less, it, it, I quote, most customers would not be bringing a vehicle to the site. Having used the motorhome for 16 years, that, that conflicts with my entire experience. If he says most would not be bringing, that means it's uh, got to be 51%. That would be most. In my experience, it's more in the order of 20 to 25% of the people don't bring vehicles. And those that don't are usually traveling in a much smaller unit where, where it's much easier to get around town, go to shopping centers, and so forth. So. Um, let me take you through what the process is of uh, arriving at, a, at an RV park and uh, getting into it. The first thing you've got to do is park your rig, which could include a motorhome and trailer or a big pickup truck and a fifth wheel trailer. You've got to park it within walking distance of the place that you're going to check into. So you go check in, and then the next thing you have to do is if it's a motorhome towing something, you have to disconnect the, uh, the vehicle from the motorhome. And I'm wondering where that's going to be done. In terms of the, uh, there we go. There's this drop-off, this thing called a drop-off area here that's in the site plan that I assume is the place where people are supposed to stop, check in, and then, uh, and then proceed to their site. But the problem is, this drop-off area is beyond the two entrances on both sides of the road to the RV park. So in order to access their site, they're going to have to make another loop around Roosevelt and Dodecanese so they can get in this driveway or this driveway. It makes it even more difficult when it's a fifth wheel being towed by a large uh, pickup truck because they're not going to be able to disconnect it. They're going to be taking that whole rig, perhaps 60 feet of it, around all these little roads for a second trip. And to what extent is that going to uh, interrupt traffic flow there? The other thing in my experience is there is a, usually a check-in time for these uh, parks. And typically, uh, there is a line of vehicles waiting to check in 
at that time of day. Just like there's a line of vehicles waiting to check out on their departure date. So I don't know what the length of this, whoops, the, Four minutes. the length of the drop-off area is uh, sufficient, but uh, I guess my time is up and I'd like to leave the owner with one more thought. I, it's a clever idea. I like the idea of All right, is this within the rules of procedure? Two minutes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. She that donates need, two minutes, correct? We need to we need, we need the uh, for the for the record. Okay. Can, did you get Annette, that, Kim? Annette Carr. Annette Carr. A -A -R. And the address? Eight one seven Buck Road Parking. Thank you. I'd like to also uh, point out one of the attractions that I find in whatever park I stay in is to uh, make sure that there's adequate tree cover, that there's a canopy over the RVs to, to prevent the sun from beating down on the roof and turning it into an oven. I haven't seen a landscape plan, I don't think, with, with this project, but I would, uh, I'd like to see some some trees in these areas providing shade. Well, I'd like to see it. I think your customers would like to see the shade so that they're not burning up all of your electricity, cooling an oven, <laughs> all right? And uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is the, the extra five spaces here. They are separated from the RV spaces where the RVs are gonna be not only uh, by the street, but there is a, I guess, a translucent uh, screening in so that they're gonna have to walk around like that. The, uh, there's a lot of uh, movement back and forth of equipment and, and food and, and various other things between the, uh, the towed vehicle and the RV, and I think this would not be a very good solution. So I will uh, thank you for the two minutes. And I uh, wish you luck with this. I think it's a great idea because it's, always, it's been my concept. I used to live in Clearwater Beach that the best use of waterfront property in a coastal high hazard area mm -hmm. is an RV park because you can roll the hell out of there when the storm is coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, that might be the, the future of the sponge docks 20 or 30 years from now, but good luck to you on this. Uh, <clears throat> Do we have any other members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Tina Bukovalis, 115 Athens Street. I have been sworn in. Um, I think the applicant really knows what he's doing as a businessman, and I congratulate you for even thinking of raising the road. But I do think there are some problems with this application. Um, first of all, I think it's premature. There, uh, we need an independent outside traffic study uh, to be done. Um, the travel route is down a congested street, Dodecanese, with a narrow roundabout and a sharp turn into the lot. Large RVs, and they state the lengths are from 20 to 39 feet that are towing another something, are going to have trouble. Uh, they will have even more trouble when Dodecanese is closed for events or flooded. Uh, and they will have trouble on Roosevelt when it is flooded, as it frequently does. Um, so I'm not sure, frankly, that this is a great place for an RV park, although the applicant certainly does know what he's doing. And I don't want to see those enormous vehicles also trying to get out and cutting through the tiny streets of Greektown, which are essentially like one-way streets that they would have trouble getting through without hitting the cars that are already parked. Moreover, um, the study and report for the Greektown vision plan is being completed now. And there, have, there were many suggestions at recent meetings 
both meetings, I was at both of them, for closing dodecanese at certain times of the day or on certain days and redirecting traffic. So this current proposal is really, I think, inappropriate until we get that report. And I was told by, I, I think it was the consultant, but it might have been staff that that report may be coming in as early as March. Um, and I think the Turtle Cove people know this too because they were at the meeting. Also, I want to point out that the site is outside the Greektown Historic District, but it's one block outside the district. And it's not, and there, it is a block or two, depending which way you go, from a residential district. Would you like an RV park a block or two from your house? I mean, it may be a very upscale RV park, but I don't think any of us particularly do want that, especially not when you are a historic district that is trying hard to retain the historical character and is trying to put guidelines in place to do so. I think it's a great idea to do this. I'm not sure if it's the right place. Frankly, most RV parks are on the edge of towns, not in the middle of towns. And there are all sorts of problems that need to be studied more thoroughly, I think, before this can take place. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public wishing to comment? Peter Lux, 514 Ashland Avenue. Tarpon Springs, and just for the record, Ms. Annie Samarcus uh, has donated two minutes of time, so I can start at six. See, it's already ticking, thank address, you. Please. All right, so Carl kind of gave you- Can you give your the rest of your address for Ms. Creighton? Yeah, and 514 also, Ashland Avenue, Tarpon Springs. And you were sworn, correct? Yes, correct, Annie thank you. Annie Samarcus' address as well. Okay. Ms. Just, Marcos, can you give your address for the record to Ms. Creighton? All right, so now that all the official signing in stuff, can I get reset at six? Thank you, dear. All right, just want to follow up a little bit on what Carl spoke. I have been camping. I bought in April 21, we bought a 22 and a half foot Coachman Catalina. I pull it with a F-150 and I've had to learn how to pull in and out of parks. Now. One thing about parks, usually they have a checkout time by 11, no long, and then you check in by two or three. And as Carl mentioned, you're gonna have somebody waiting there, maybe they come in at two o'clock, waiting to get checked in. They're sitting there. You got Pelican Point or somebody else wanting to get another truck through, and then you get another RV come behind it. You've got backed up traffic, and he already explained to you some of the issues with regards to that. But I want to focus on a couple of the things that weren't specifically brought up. When I look at the site plan, I don't see a dump station, and Mr. Space said that he's going to have individual dump stations. And what that means, at each site, there's going to be a hole in the ground with a cap. You take the cap off, you take your, your hose from, your, from the bottom of your, your trailer or your RV, and you run it. Those people who hook up long-term, they stay there and leave it that way. Now, if you're at a place with a dump station, you hold it till you leave and you dump it at one place. Now, we talk about flooding. What happens when you got 16 septic tubes running in and then you got a quick high king tide and a rainstorm and then the water floods in? You're going to flood into those, those tanks, maybe overflow them. Secondly, they're proposing an underground vault system. You're already, I think from what I saw in the record, some of the geological, only three feet above the water table. How are you gonna be putting in an underground vault system in a coastal high hazard area? So those are things that really are logistically concerns of mine with regards to it. I believe this is a novel idea, it can be used, but I also look at it as putting in 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound bag, and I'm gonna explain that a little further to you. I don't know how many of you have an RV or have experienced an RV, but I've been in trailer parks or 
state parks where there are RVs and a lot of these big homes, as the gentleman mentioned, it's true, they've got pop outs, slide outs. So when they drive, it's nice and narrow, eight feet. But when they park, you can pop out a big section which has a couch, a dining room table, it can go out five feet. So if you look at the diagrams, you only got 10 feet between them. So the way they usually work, if you're looking like you're driving, this side you have a canopy, this side you got a pop out. So I, you park here and then I park next to you. I wanna put my canopy out, that goes out five feet. He puts out his pop out, that's five feet. You got canopies and pop outs hitting. I just don't, you're just trying to put too much into too small a space. He's explained that, yeah, there's room in there to make turnarounds. But if you look at the circulation diagram, to get, you gotta pull way in and then back out. So if you're in the back space, how are you gonna pull way in and then back out? And there is, like I said, there's no dump station. There will be electrical hookups. But the other factor is really, like he's mentioned, he's gonna raise the road. So where does that water then go to, to your adjoining properties? So are we going to have problems with the adjoining properties there? I believe this could be worked, but it, be, it, it really needs to be scaled down a little bit more. It would give more room for canopies and trees. When you look at these pictures in there, it's kind of hard to get perception of, of the distances between these places. And they look all nice and manicured and such of that nature. But in reality, they get used, they get worn, unless it's really properly maintained and upkeep, you're gonna get dust and dirt from places that are in between these places unless it's properly maintained. But another factor um, really is getting in and out of this area. As the gentleman mentioned, a lot of these units are GPS. So you're coming down Live Oak and you get to Dodecanese and then you start going, then you see, ooh, there's water there. What are you gonna do, turn on a Ferris and go up to Cedar to go up to Athens or go across to Hope, and then come back around to Roosevelt to loop back around? How are you gonna get these vehicles to come through there? And yes, the GPS may tell you to go to Tarpon Avenue and come to Spring and come up Grand to eventually to Roosevelt and all these jigger jaggeries, but you're gonna be driving big coach buses through smaller neighborhoods because people don't like to be backed up and already there's quite a bit of backup traffic. So if you get somebody delivering uh, supplies to Laura's Soaps or Mykonos, and you got another bus behind there and you got traffic, I just think it needs to be looked at in a large and a better scale and maybe reduce some of the impact that's potential because with an underground vault, high tides, flooding, some of those issues I don't think have been properly addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any further members of the public wishing to comment? All right. Seeing none, uh, we will close public comments. Uh, does staff have any rebuttal or closing comments? No. Would the applicant like to make any rebuttal or closing comments? Um, so the issue as far as the underground vault system, um, my engineer and I worked with Rick, um, who does the stormwater plan for the city. Um, initially, the way it was designed, the, between raising the road and doing what we're doing, that vault system and the property is being brought up to the same grade as everything that my clubhouse and everything is. So the, the vault system and the underground is coming up, so it will work and it does work. So that's the only thing I have to add. Um, okay. Regina, what, well, he's up, can I ask him a question while yes. he's up there? Okay. Um, I did, if you don't mind, sure. could you respond to Mr. Wagenfer's point about like the unloading and offloading is? Sure. Yeah. Both of the gentlemen have said they've visited RV 
parks. Um, you could go to a restaurant that has eight seats or you can go to a restaurant that has 500 seats or 150 seats. I can't comment where they went or stayed at as far as uh, a sewer dump. Um, each site has a clean out at it. And what that is is basically at the pad, you take the sewer hose, you unscrew the cap like you do a clean out at your house. If a plumber needs to come, he will go in front of your house and there is a cap that goes in that they can fish and go all the way out to the sewer or wherever they're at. Each one of these sites has that. There is no sewer dump. Some of these older facilities did not have the underground utilities in place to where the same thing at my marina. Every one of my wet slips has a pump out nozzle at the slip so you don't have to go. Very few marinas on this river have pump out. And I'm sorry, I think I so, but I'm saying, so as I, far as the clean out. I, I think or, you misunderstood yeah. my Oh, I'm sorry, I meant no. checking in and checking oh, out. Oh, checking in, checking yeah. out. So <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know where they went. Um, again, these, the, the traffic coming into these places, that's why we added that area to the left there. If so people drive in to, to, to drive okay. in to stop, everybody's got to walk somewhere to an office no matter where we're at. Our office is right across, I mean, literally I mean, 100 feet. Can you just feet. drive into your site and then just walk to? They can, it, it, if, if we know what's going on, there's going to be motorized arms or gates, okay? They can pull in there. If we know they're coming, they can call. I mean, that this is going to be, be logistics. Airbnb I don't think there's, what's that? Things. We have Airbnb of apps, like, you know, just to, because that would be a problem. Yeah, no, I understand. Like, but but the, they can yeah. check in remotely. So yeah, that's what, that's what I was going to say are, is what you're asking about, the remote check-in capability. Because that would cause a problem, because that could really back traffic up. The majority, and, yeah. the majority of these sites, Georgina, is when, when you go to them now today, it's all app-based. You're 110%. Right, right. And you have to pay for that site prior to getting there. But what they say is when you get there, you still have to go check in and get your packet or whatever. Now, if you happen to come in after hours, a lot of times they leave your package there. They'll give you the code to get through the gate, and then you go to the office the following morning. Mo majority of these places close down at 5 o'clock. Our marina closes at 5 o'clock. These people have to be there before 5 o'clock. Would they be checking so. in on Island Drive and not Roosevelt? Or <clears throat> They'll be checking in on that, on that off, that little area that we added there on Island. Okay, so right there. And then they'll walk over to the clubhouse. They'll, they'll walk down Roosevelt into our clubhouse. Waiting on Roosevelt, though. No, okay. no, no. And then just um, another, if, if, if when we make a motion, would less than 16 be something, would it be worth it? Or there's like 16, like if, if I can't do 16, then it's just not worth it for me. Or would something, if it's possible with Attorney Kardashian, like, could he start something smaller and then come back for more, <clears throat> like like 14 or something like that because of the... Well, I, I guess this would kind of be my question because, you know, you may be getting into some industry-specific type issues. Um, when you design roads, you know, you have minimum road widths that you have to abide by under guidelines that are published in MUT, MUTCD, mm -hmm. right? So I'm wondering if there's something similar that says this is the minimum width or size for an RV site, or if there's some industry standard publication that you may have used um, to develop this particular plan. It was this was all done through the engineer, and we right now currently the Jolly Trolley and everything comes down that road it's no wider well, than, I, so what i'm saying is we it's not no. the road though it's, <laughs> it's it's i'm not i'm not really asking about the roads yeah. because i'm assuming the roads were built to the minimum lists that are required uh, under law yeah. but um I'm, what i'm asking about is if there is a minimum width for the particular path you could you, the, the, so, so the, the sites where you're the, the, the sites RVs. themselves the sites themselves yes, yes. Some vehicles, the, the majority of the new vehicles today that are on the road mm. have slide outs that they come out, okay? Mm. Normally, they will, it'll be on a driver's side or a passenger's side. Some of them have multiple slides on different sides. It's, it's, it's like a boat. Mm. The, whatever the flavor's out there is what you buy if you like it. There is still room to get in between these. They do have awnings. I, I understand 
what, what they're saying, but these things are not going to be touching each other. I, I, we, we looked at potentially adding more in there as, as based on the land volume. I believe it was up to like 18. I cut it back to 16 because I don't want it that tight. So I have already scaled down on what I potentially had drawn up the first time and the back parking lot back there where the five parking spaces are, that was at one time I was considering on adding a site or two in there and I, and I didn't do that. So I, at 16 is a viable project for me to make it happen and to work and, 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 it, and it flows and it works. Would they have parking passes? When, who, the, the people when they check in? Yeah. Well, th I mean, th they will come in and then their cars, it's like, it's, it's like our marina doesn't have parking passes. I mean, so the same situation. But he has plans to possibly do a parking sure. lot across, and that's, I mean, wouldn't want that to in, infringe because that's part of one of the actual requirements here that it doesn't do, you know, uh, understand overload public facilities. So we'd want to make sure that that's not, that people aren't, if we did, that parking lot happens for the tourism industry, that, that the visitors aren't using that and overloading it, you know, so. I understand. Mean, yeah. I mean, it's the same situation. I mean, we have people come down here and well, said, they're in my this, parking lot like to, to go down to this bunch so. so we're just trying yeah. to figure it out. I gotcha. All right. I guess we'll, we'll bring it back to the board for consideration then. I need um, a motion and a second. A uh, motion must be in the affirmative and then we can discuss further. Chair, I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to motion that we approve resolution number 2024-06 as submitted with the conditions as specified by attorney Kardash regarding the ownership that was already clearly discussed with staff. And the conditions put in by the city as well. As well as the conditions stated as a city. I'll second. Mm. All right, do we have? Wait, so there's two parts to this. The first is the conditional use approval and the staff condition um, referenced is the total number of parking RV pads, um, lodging units shall be limited to 16 was the conditional use approval condition recommended by staff. I added a condition with regard to uh, the lease required the six weeks uh, under, under the current statute. Mm -hmm. And that, that is the condition that you're requesting for the conditional use approval? Mm -hmm. Conditional use as well okay. as the, uh, the added condition with regard to ownership. Or so the any, parking, or that would be for the site plan. That would be for the second part of it. So uh, forgive me, I may have made an error. I only saw one resolution. If there were two, I just can't see it on the screen. So would you like us to back up and it's do two different motions? It's one resolution, um, I'll defer. It's, yeah, it's one, it's one resolution, but it's two motions because one is the approval of the conditional use for them to use the property in this manner. And then the second part is the site plan approval. Okay. And the site plan approval, there's two conditions that staff recommended. Um, and if you look at the staff report, um, I'm looking at the very first page, just above the current property information with respect to the preliminary staff recommendations. It is one resolution, but two parts. Okay, so I'm gonna amend, and I'd like to strike that previous motion, and I'm gonna like to make my first motion to be approval for 23-122. Would that be correct? Okay, Which is a conditional use, use. Yes. That includes the warrants that are requested within that conditional use? Those are with the site plan. <laughs> of course. <laughs> You're doing good. <laughs> Do I need some guidance here? And you're doing good. Keep going. Am I doing good? The, the warrants would be um, by the condition. So no, the warrants were separate. There was two separate warrants that were requested. Um, one warrant was. Let me go back. It's all like you're arrested. Um, one warrant was with respect to the parking, and that was for the five off-site. That would be part of the site plan. Which is the second motion. Right, and then also the fence and the hedge. Correct. Which is the yes. second motion. Correct. Okay, mm -hmm. so would the first motion include the two conditions 
that um, have been carefully discussed. Yes. The, okay. The two conditions would be the R, the RV parking pads lodging limit to 16, and then the, the Mr. Kuskudis is for the uh, that, that that they be uh, 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 six weeks maximum be included in any lease agreement. I have some uh, some verbiage. If you'd like me to read that, just for clarity, yes, for that you. second condition. Um, we are recommending a rental term shall be for six weeks or less in compliance with the definition of seasonal short-term rental in section section 6.1 of the smart code. Perfect, yes. Understood. That would be in addition to the uh, condition on the screen. And then I think their third, was it the third that the, uh, or that be a, the, the second motion with regard to ownership of the parking? That would be the second one. All right. The other condition you may want to consider is um, a requirement for, um, we kind of discussed it a little bit, um, but I wasn't sure if you wanted to consider um, a condition uh, with respect to the leasing office being located um, on an adjacent property. That's optional for the next motion. I would say that that would be part of the conditional use. Uh, okay. I would, well, I I'm, I'm going to. I am actually not going to opt in my motion to include the leasing office verbiage. Okay. So at this point, the motion to approve the conditional use with the conditions as requested by staff and then the additional condition by Mr. Cuscudos. Done. Does that include Good. everything that you've... Mm -hmm. okay. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Do we have board discussion? Let me... I, I am... am really support the project more now than I did from what I read before. I do have a lot of concerns about the traffic, mm -hmm. but I don't think that a traffic study is going to do anything yeah. different than what the engineer, whoever was already hired, does. I think that's a problem that we, in what Ms. Bukovalis addressed is, is true. It's one block away, and the staff's just it, it, it concerns me because it's, it's the staff's just outright blind spot of the fact that, oh yeah, it's outside the historic district, but it's, it's like right here. Yeah. And I understand that, that we have to look at everything just the way it is, but then again, we look at something like, well, technically the smart code says this. The smart code, I mean, to go outside and, and try to even deviate from the smart code once you're in it is outlandish. And then at the same time, pretend that this is a hard line between the historic district and right here, and we're going to follow that. But then technically the smart code says this, but you know what? It's close enough. Okay. And you can't have it both ways. But that is a city problem. And again, I mean, I, I would like to put a condition on here for a traffic study, but well, I, I don't feel like that would really do anything different. I think they're going to pass it. Cause, yeah. and if Mr. Zambellis was here, he'd be great to say, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. <laughs> you know, we're just riding up against people. Mm. Um, and I'm really not against the project. I mean, if it goes as, as, you know, as it should, I think that it is a good idea. But again, I, I, it's really more of how it was presented to us. And, and again, I, I'm glad that, you know, that you came and spoke, and I, I knew your history with the town, um, but I'm, I'm more disappointed in, in how it was it was addressed to us, and and that's an issue again that we have to fix with with the smart code and everything. Um, but I mean, as it is, I, I support it, but I, I do have issues, and I, I don't want the, anyone to think. And I, Mr. Wagenforth, your concerns and the canopy and all that. I don't know if it's. He started with 18 and he went to 16. I believe that he did and went down to that. I think he's worked with staff. I know I talked to Pat today and he worked with TRC, went back a few times. Um, I do have concerns with, again, it being right next to the docks, but it, I just don't feel like it's something that we can do to say no to it tonight. So I, I mean, and the, all the conditions I think are, we're going uh, and, and not to beat a dead horse, but I think a traffic study would be flawed to begin with, because how do you, remember we, they had a traffic study when they did the apartment, okay? And that was oh, flawed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and you know, because when do you do the study? During season, during off season? Right. Uh, you know, during the time of day? Uh, so, so any traffic study I think would be flawed. 
Um, our, you know, we talked about, there was a concern about RVs coming down Dota Canese. Well, people come down with RVs down Dota Canese anyways, and they park in the parking lot when they want to go to the sponge docks. I see them all the time. Yeah. Well, like, well, it's yeah. a mess yeah. down there so, anyways, so who cares? And that's yeah. the attitude I don't like. Oh, I know that. I know that, but, but now we're telling, you know, people can't, you know, if you've got an RV, you shouldn't come down to Canese, even if you go into a certain specific location. We're not talking about 50 spots. We're talking about 16. Probably not coming out, 16 people coming all in one day. Um, you know, um, uh, you know. I, so I, I think it's, and, and like as I disclosed, I, I've known Ed for, for a while. I've represented him before in other matters. But I, I will tell you this. Um, when you look at what he's done at Turtle Cove, what he could have done versus what he did, he could have built a marina that didn't have the, the curb appeal that it currently has, that blended in, that he took, he went over the top when he, when he designed it and built it to, to uh, have, have a, a, you know, it look uh, as nice as he could for the neighborhood. And, and, and so that just shows the quality of, of, of what he's done in the past, and there's no reason not to believe that he won't do what's quality moving forward. Um, and I would just comment that the, the, tr the traffic is the most serious concern for sure. And in my mind, that's more of a management issue uh, and, and something they're gonna have to deal with. Because if they get three or four big buses stacked up out there waiting in line to get in, all hell's gonna break loose and those people are gonna leave mm -hmm. and they're not ever coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, the people that drive those things generally know what they're doing as you said they're like they're like boaters a few of them don't but generally they do and generally they plot exactly how they're going to get where they need to be because they know they're driving a big vehicle that's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars uh and as long as his staff is very supportive and works with them to get them where they need to be when they need to be there so they don't stack up for the small number of buses that you've got here, I, I don't think it'll be a problem. Yeah. We'll call for the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll uh, Yeah, if nobody else has comments. Just, uh, a, just a quick comment, Chairman, if I could. Uh, as stated by everyone, the traffic implications, and really it's public safety implications, because if somebody gets struck or someone's caused to deviate from the prescribed path of the road, bad things can happen. Uh, Traffic studies are very static. They're whatever period of time they're conducted, whatever conditions, and things can change in an hour uh, and be very different. Same thing with GPS. It may tell you to go a certain way. This is the shortest. This is the quickest. Doesn't mean it's the best. I mean, I've heard of GPSs running people down railroad tracks and such. What I would ask you to do to be proactive with is investigating all the possible routes in and out and providing that in advance to the folks, saying if this, if this is bad here, do this. Don't depend upon artificial intelligence to you know, direct you per se. You have a good feel for what's here on a daily basis. Uh, if you can provide that and say these are option A, option B, option C, if there are problems or, or some sort of uh, condition or, or something that prevents that uh, preferred route. Uh, it is tight there. The historic district is historic for a reason. The residential district is residential for a reason. It's not commercial in nature. Even though the little strip along the waterfront is, everything else around it kind of is not, with the exception of Dogeknese, and that's, that can be the traffic nightmare that, like you said, turns people off. So anything you can do and provide to your clients proactively, I think that would solve some problems before they even occur, and that, that would be my aim. Right. Can we have a roll call, please? Ms. Swenson? Aye. Yes. Early? With conditions, I would say yes. And I do want to say this, if nobody minds. It's too late to talk. It is a roll call. Mr. Rockline? Yes, with the conditions. Mm -hmm. Ms. Francis? Yes. Jesse? Yes. Mr. Kuskudis? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. All right. 
<clears throat> Can we take five minutes? Well, you still we'll have, finish. before we take the five oh, minutes, take the the site, let's sorry. take the site plan, because yeah. that's yeah, got its take own conditions plan. attached okay. with it. Chair, I'd like to motion that we approve application number 23-123 site plan. That Hold on, I just want to make sure. The, yeah, the, Is the motion with the two conditions approving the warrants and then adding the requested condition with respect to the ownership of the property and the five parking spaces. Yes, it is. Okay. And with staff's conditions. And with what, the two yes, typical the two. Yes. yes. Yes, it is. And I would second that as stated. Can we have a roll call? Ms. Swenson? Yes. Ms. Early? Yes. Mr. Rockline? Yes. Ms. Francis? Yes. Mr. Vesey? Yes. Mr. Kuzkudis? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. Yep. All right, now, let's uh, take a five minute break.
back at it. Uh, we've got application 23-01, resolution 2024-07, a conditional use approval and site plan approval for property located at 38954 U.S. Highway 19 North. Uh, do we have a staff presentation? Yes, good evening, Pat McNeese, Planning Supervisor. Um, this is a request um, for establishment of basically a, a bingo hall, which in your code is, is called a gaming, basically a ga gaming use. Um, at uh, 38954 U.S. Highway 19 North. This is um, relocation of the Belcher Bingo that's in the Olympic Plaza over to this site. This is a redevelopment of this site, which was the Los Mexicanos, I think, mm -hmm. restaurant, Mexican restaurant that's been demolished. So that's what this proposal is tonight. This is on 1.3 acres in a commercial general feature land use, highway business zoning, and again, the use is game room, which is conditional in highway business. So this is a um, new building expanded to replace the uh, building that was demolished, and uh, there will be uh, upgrades to the site with landscaping, parking, lighting uh, upgrades, and of course the building will be new. And uh, the stormwater and some access facilities are shared with the property next door. So this is the site in highway business zoning. Um, just surrounding areas, there is a, a wetland area um, here that we'll see in a minute on the future land use. Uh, but basically, it's on that commercial strip, of course, of US-19. So you've got highway business zoning through here uh, with mobile home park there. Um, this, of course, is Anderson Park across the across the US-19. And um, probably closest residential is mobile home over here, Sun Valley Mobile Home Park. And then on the north, you've got storage down here. You've got a, a small shopping center and pub, the public storage facility. So that's uh, where you are on 19. This is a future land use map. Again, this is a preservation um, wetland area. Um, this is commercial general, um, as much of 19 is. And uh, you have the other land surrounding residential and then park open space. This is just an aerial of the site. And this is an oblique of the site taken after the building was demolished. There are a couple of walls still up on two sides of the building. Um, we'll see the site plan here in a minute. There's some con con old concrete pad they're gonna be removing from the rear of the property. Obviously the property will be rehabilitated to upgrade uh, the facilities. The Parcel shares a stormwater facility in the back with the mini storage that's next door. And they do have a shared access easement going down this um, common property line. So again, this was the site of the a previous restaurant. And this is a um, just an overlay of the survey showing um, this survey was apparently done when the restaurant was still there, showing that they had a, a port go share uh, entrance at that restaurant that's now gone, showing the concrete in the back, the parking lot that was existing, and the entrance to US-19. This is the proposed site plan showing um, the basically the same entrance with uh, two-way traffic flow here, and then they've got some one-way traffic uh, going um, on the north side of the property and uh, some two-way um, access to parking in a couple of other areas. Um, we'll uh, kind of go through what they're providing for facilities, but basically um, the building is um, 
Uh, the previous building was about 5,900 square feet. They are expanding to about 9,600 square feet uh, for the building, adding landscaping, including uh, back by the stormwater pond, and adding new th uh, three new handicap spaces. Um, they have 48 parking spaces, so that's sufficient for their use. Um, this is just a, a view, a elevation view of the US-19 side, uh, showing what the building will look like. Um, this has a seating capacity of 84 seats. The applicant has stated that the usual will be 40 to 50, and the applicant is present to address the use. Um, so this is just kind of a depiction of the floor plan and what that looks like. So this uh, project is uh, in conformance with the land development code. Um, let me just say um, the conditional use of game room, I, I feel like I'm not sure the exact history, but I feel like that is probably conditional because over the years, some of you may remember some of the issues that um, many counties, in fact, the last place I worked had with internet gambling, we still have. Sometimes people try to bring, bring slot machines and open something until they get caught. We, you know, code enforcement will <laughs> regularly, uh, you know, see that kind of thing try to happen um, in different shopping centers. So that issue, I think, was something that um, probably made this, this um, any type of game room a conditional use. Uh, we ended up running the game room at Whiskey Wings through conditional use. It's the kids' game room a few years ago. So that tells you really the kind of proposals that we do get. This is a bingo hall, the Belcher Bingo. It's been operating nine or ten years. The applicant can address that uh, over at Olympic Plaza. Um, it is compliant with state law. The applicant has provided uh, that information. There is a Pinellas County bingo, bingo ordinance that they have to comply with. They also have that license and, and are compliant with that. So that's, that's kind of the conditional use. Uh, the things that are included in, in there are pool rooms, arcades, and bingo. I mean, uh, game rooms. That's what the conditional use is. So kind of an interesting um, older leftover part of our code, in my opinion. Um, so um, the uh, land development code standards for highway business are found on pages five and six of the staff report, uh, showing how the property complies with the land development code. They are going to be um, reducing impervious surface, uh, as I said, uh, making some uh, improvements to the property, adding the landscaping back in. Basically, it was virtually all gone from whatever the Mexican restaurant had, uh, adding some landscape islands in the parking lot, that sort of thing. So it does conform with the code. Um, this is an appropriate redevelopment site. You all have seen several sites. Um, I think the three most recent have been car washes redeveloping. So this one's a bingo hall, it's just kind of a different thing, but it's um, very compatible with that um, uh, US-19 commercial corridor. It's well away from the adjacent uh, or the nearby residential Sun Country spot, probably the closest. The applicant has stated they are going to be operating till 10 p.m. I think the Pinellas County bingo ordinance allows like a um, operation until 3 a.m. So they're well within that. They are well away from, you know, any kind of residential, at least 600 feet from uh, at least Sun Country. Uh, so there should be, um, it should be compatible and well suited to the commercial corridor. Um, it's consistent with the commercial general feature land use category that it's in. It is not in a historic district. This is a redevelopment of a previously developed site, and we expect upgrades to the site so there are no environmental impacts. And um, 
it, those site upgrades really are, uh, it, it's, it's a welcome redevelopment. The, those are expected to maintain property values along 19 and, and keep those stable at least. Um, the property is served by facilities, so the previous restaurant was served. Um, the, um, the entrance is the same, so they will be using that same entrance on US 19, so there won't be any impact there. Um, the trip generation uh, at seating capacity of 84 seats, I came up with maybe 11 new peak hour trips. So the previous use was a fast, um, fast casual sit down restaurant. Um, so they did provide um, peak hour trips of 40, but they failed to um, ac account for the peak hour trips that they were replacing. So that, that was just something that, that they, they missed. Um, so yeah, 40, I came up with 41 for um, Bingo Hall, which the trip generation manual actually has a specific category for Bingo Hall, believe it or not. Um, so they were right on there, but, the, but they get credit for the trip generation from the Mexican restaurant. So, um, like I say, at the 40 to 50 usual daily crowd, they're actually going to reduce the trips on 19. Um, so, this is expected to, to continue an orderly development pattern on that commercial strip on 19, and it does comply with the land development code. Um, the, it's expected to comply with building code. And we feel like health, safety, welfare are being observed because this will upgrade really what was a deteriorated site. Uh, for the site plan, uh, the project does comply with the comprehensive plan. We just um, uh, touched on that. And with the land development code, it is served by facilities and it does comply with the concurrency management system and it's expected to comply with all city building codes. So we've recommended approval with one condition for the game room use, which is that they need to obtain a local business tax receipt. So they will just be able to um, terminate the one they have now and apply for that uh, business tax over at the new address. And then we have seven, uh, six conditions, sorry, for site plan approval. Um, all utilities have to need to be verified on site by the applicant. Um, the design standards for the site lighting and con traffic control signage need to be on that final uh, set of plans um, that they bring for a building permit application. Um, we advise that a construction permit may be needed from FDOT. These redevelopments have been involving disturbance of the DOT right-of-way. Um, there have been on and off issues um, uh, with uh, uh, working around the FDOT uh, drainage system, existing drainage system. So we want to caution them that they need to coordinate uh, their project with the, the FDOT. Um, they need to be consistent with the site plan, with their building permit, and um, this application came in before you all um, adopted the new timeframes for development orders. So this falls under that previous code. So they have one year to come in for a building permit. I believe they already actually applied for one and then found out they needed to go through site plan. So I, I, the applicants here, but I expect they uh, would like to proceed to construction as soon as they can, so that should be fine. And then just a note about public art on the value of the project, just a reminder um, that that would be due if the project goes over a million dollars. Are there any questions on this one? I have a couple questions. Um, the current FDOT cutout, is that something that will remain? Is that, or is that the F current FDOT? access point they will they will be that, using that access okay. point as configured okay is there going to be a d cell lane into the, the right turn no 
Okay, the FDOT would not, uh, I mean, with the new F FDOT requirements, they, they don't require a D-cell? I, when they coordinate with FDOT, we will confirm that, but I doubt it. I, I seriously doubt they will uh, require a deceleration light now okay. for the CS. Okay, with regard to the, co the conditional use, uh, so you said the applicant hours of operation will be till 10 p.m.? Yes, the hours they stated um, are 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. Okay, so um, to that extent, we can make that a, con a, a condition as to the use? Uh, we could. You, right. Yes, you can. There's All no right. problem with that. All right. Yeah. I know, I was just asking. And they note five days a week. I'm not sure which days, so they can answer that. Are you serving liquor or just beer and wine? Uh, they, uh, they can talk about whether they will be applying for that. We have not received any um, application for any alcohol beverage service, and I don't know if the current facility has that. I could ask the applicant. Ms. McNeese, I have a question about the landscaping. Mm -hmm. And it, forgive me, but you know, on all of these that we see come before us, I'm starting to, I can't remember when it was, we, were, we had a lot of discussion about canopy. Maybe it was at one of our workshops. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for people to just throw up a palm tree here and there, do we have any requirements in this particular case that it be a canopy type tree that is planted instead yes of landscaping is limited the the required landscaping um, and tree replacement numbers are limited to a total of 25 percent palm trees now they've proposed all shade trees on this one mm -hmm. okay, um, you. but you can't go more than 25 percent palm trees and you have to group palm trees in, in threes so if you're going to put one in you're going to have to do a, a group of three. Do you know what I've noticed, though, about a lot of new develop, I say a building or a business, they'll plant the plants and the trees, but then they don't water them and they die. We do enforcement on that, and we do have active enforcement cases. Okay, good. Cases. <laughs> yeah. yes. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. You're welcome. Any other Any questions? Any further questions for staff? Seeing none, would the applicant like to make a presentation? You do have to come up here to, to the podium. The state your name and address, please. My name is Jonathan Kreidler. My address is 1272 North Jasmine Avenue, Tarpon Springs. And yes, I've been sworn in. Do we have questions of the applicant? had some questions about what kind of food or um, beverages you'd be serving. Um, as of right now, our current location does not have a beer and wine license. It's something that we thought about possibly applying for in the future, but they, we've talked to somebody um, prior with that, and because of how it's a type of gambling nature, they kind of, they just said, yeah, you probably won't get approved. So we never put set forth, and that was back in 2010. So just like vending machines or some yeah. kind of snacks? Yeah, well, well, we're going to have a snack bar that's going to serve, you know, like sandwiches, um, you know, hot dogs, burgers, stuff like that. It's more just, it's quick serve, just to, just to appease people while they're actually sitting there playing bingo. And was there like a membership or anything like that, or just anybody comes? And no, it's just yeah. open to the public. Yep, anybody. And the current days are five days a week. We're closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. We've actually been in Tarpon Springs since 2009, so going on 15 years. Any further questions? Seeing none, uh, you can sit down for now, and does any member of the public here have comments on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll uh, end public comments. And uh, does staff have any additional comments they want to make? No, thank you. And the applicant, no further comments? Okay. 
uh, then we'll bring the item back to the board for consideration. I need a motion and a second. Oh, this is, this, this is, would be for the conditional use, right? Correct. This is like the last one. We have your conditional use approval with one condition recommended by staff and then the site plan approval with six conditions recommended by staff. So I'll make, I'll make a motion with regard to the conditional use approval 2024-07 as to the conditions put forth by the city. I'll second. Mm -hmm. Is there any board discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, can we have a roll call, please? Yes. 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 Then I will go ahead and make a motion with regard to the site plan approval uh, with the conditions set forth by the city. I would second that. Any discussion? Seeing none, can we have a roll call? Ms. Swenson? Yes. Ms. Early? Yes. Mr. Rockline? Yes. Ms. Francis? Yes. Mr. Vesey? Yes. Mr. Kuskudis? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. All right, that brings us to application 2368, resolution 2024-09, that's site plan approval for property located at 332 Anclo Road. Do we have a staff presentation? Yes, thank you. Um, this is uh, site plan approval for a boat storage facility at 332 Anclo Road. And um, this will be an outdoor uh, storage facility in the industrial general land use category and the waterfront marine industry development district. It's a long name, the WD2 uh, um, zoning district. Um, so this would be outdoor boat and trailer storage for use by patrons. It would be a remote uh, access um, type of facility and it includes a boat wash down area. The site is located where Ancolt Road turns, turns north there right before um, bordering um, Tarpon Key uh, subdivision there. So it, it's this little site here on the corner. And uh, that is again in WD2, there's WD1B and WD2 across the street. Tarpon Key is residential multifamily. And then you've got some industrial zone property uh, to the north and northeast on there. Um, the, um, this is just an aerial of the site. Um, Anclote Isles Marina is to the south and there's Tarpon Key subdivision. And this industrial zone land is, is vacant currently. This is just an oblique of the site. Um, there is a note in your staff report. Um, there was a, uh, these pictures were taken uh, January, 2023. Um, there were some fleet vehicles uh, parked on the property, but those are uh, no longer there. So this was the site of the JRL Outboard and Marine Service. Um, that was uh, a boat repair facility boat, boat uh, with accessory boat storage that was there for several years um, that was approved in the WD2 district. That was approved as a marina type use. This would also be approved uh, or allowed by right as a marina use, meeting that definition of a marina use. This is the site as it appears now, except that the fleet vehicles are not there. But this is pretty much how it looks uh, with the entrance. It's, it's uh, fenced currently and uh, with some opaque uh, screening on the fence. And this is the survey of the site. The site is basically um, 
a lime rock surface with some millings and a couple uh, sections of concrete where the driveways were for the previous use. Um, and this is the site plan. So this is an outdoor storage facility. So it's a pretty basic site plan. Um, you've got the parking stops here on the north side where people would come in, park their boats, um, and their, their, um, and you know, be able to pull out, maneuver uh, in this large area to be able to park, uh, bring a boat over to the washdown to use that. Uh, there are no other facilities on the site, so there's really no reason to stay. Um, people will be coming and going, dropping off their boats, picking up their boats. Um, basically, the, the applicant, uh, I mean, there's not a whole lot to look at here, but the applicant is um, redeveloping the property and really upgrading and bringing the property into compliance with code and improving the property. So they are going to be reducing the impervious surface, enhancing the wetland buffer. We'll touch on that in a minute. They're going to upgrade the site to comply with the current stormwater handling requirements, which the previous site did not. Uh, the structures that were on that site, which have all been demolished, uh, the house was from like the 40s or 20s. You know, there were, it was an older site that was turned into a marine repair. So this will be upgraded. Uh, for stormwater, there was an on-site sewage disposal system that's been abandoned and uh, that will be replaced with, with sewer service. And we're going to be reducing the number of access drives. There were four access drives along here. Uh, that's going to be reduced to two. The applicant still needs county approval for that, so that uh, we've recommended that as a condition. But, um, so there, there are some significant improvements to the site in this redevelopment. Um, so the project is consistent with the industrial general future land use uh, map category in that zoning district. And uh, the application is in compliance with the land development code. The only thing um, uh, as far as the buffering uh, the, the code requires significant buffering. If you look at the table on page four, you'll see um, that the code requires an appropriate <coughs> buffer between adjoining non-industrial uses. So what you've got over at Tarpon Key is you've already got a wall over there um, on, on, along the Enclote Road. And then the applicant is going to be doing some landscaping and the opaque fence on this side. Um, the applicant will be doing the wetland enhancement, which includes um, some mangroves, removal of Brazilian pepper, and vegetating that wetland buffer. So they will be adding that as well. Um, the only thing that is not currently in, in compliance on this site plan is the si there's no sidewalk shown. So Anclote Road is in um, oh, um, planning, development, and environmental, what they call a PD and E study. At uh, Pinellas County, this is a county road, to improve Anclote Road, uh, including multimodal. So, we expect uh, sidewalks to be constructed here in probably the 2025 to 2027 time frame. I'll say if they're doing the PD&E right now, probably construction will be in the 26-27 fiscal year for them. That's that's my guess. I think I put 25-26 in the report, but that might be a little bit optimistic. Um, we can't waive the sidewalk requirement. They they would tear up whatever sidewalk the applicant put in in that case mm. and redo it. We can't really waive it, but the applicant can't apply for a variance or pay the in lieu fee. So that's a condition is that they do one of those two mm. uh, that we recommend. Uh, the project, project is um, compliant with the concurrency management si system. Uh, there will be no adverse impacts to city facilities. We have the ability to serve it's either served or will be served with um, facilities. Um, 
I've got quite a discussion, a little bit of a discussion about the parking there. Um, again, there's really, there, there are sufficient spaces and there's really no need for extra spaces for a marina because there's no facility there. There's no building to go to. There's nobody to check in. This will be a remote access site. We did recommend a condition that they do have on the sign outside on the gate the contact number. So if there's a fire, if there's vandalism, if there's, you know, any kind of issue, the police can call the owner and owner, you know, can have that number handy if they don't, if they don't uh, remember what it is right away. So that, that would be something we would suggest. And we do expect the site to be able to meet uh, city building codes. So we have recommended approval uh, with seven conditions. Um, the first is restricting to boat and trailer storage only. Basically, um, the permit that's required from Pinellas County for the road, that would be the, for the, uh, sorry, the site access, um, paying the in lieu sidewalk fee or getting a variance, um, and then all the other usual conditions we usually do. Uh, site plan consistent with the uh, I mean, building permit consistent with the site plan, meeting the code requirements, and expiring at one year. Um, again, this is one that came in before your code changed, so they have a year to apply for a building permit. Again, I believe this applicant is ready to proceed, so we expect uh, the building permit to follow uh, if this uh, project is approved. Are there any questions on this one? You know me. I have a question. Okay. Um, with regard, you had mentioned that uh, the boat wash, is that going to be a separate structure? Uh, if it is a stru separate structure, is there going to be retention of any oils or, or runoff or whatever with regard to when you wash a boat, whatever, you know, uh, sometimes if you wash out a motor or et cetera, um, how is that going to be captured? Uh, yeah, so if you're going to ask me the technical and the project engineer is here. You could probably explain okay. it better than me, but yeah, there was a bit of discussion back and forth. Um, there is a system that utilities um, has approved without having those building permit details. They will review that to capture that. It also has to be covered, so it is indicated covered so that we don't have rainwater going into that system. So all those standards were required at TRC. This went back, this went to TRC. Oh, would, probably. Would that be a separate two building or three per, times? Sorry. Would that be a separate building permit? Mm. Um, it it can be part of the site work. Um, they may need a separate um, permit for their meter. They've got to put sewer in. If it's, That's, I'm not sure if it's there yet, but oh. a, a plumbing permit for their sewer. You know, oh. it could be a separate. So one. how do we assure compliance with with that requirement? The uh, when they come in for their building permit, I asked you if they re would require a building permit, and I, I don't think you, the, the answer was yes. Yes, they they would. They have that's why I, the question was: they do they need a building permit to build a? Um, oh, I thought you said a separate building permit. So they do need a building permit. It may be it may be one or more permits. Okay. So, yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. Well, I, I suspect the water management district would want to look at the boat wash area too, probably. Yes, and they have, I believe, received, it's in your packet, um, uh, an exemption from the water management district, so. Um, Ms. McNeese, I have a quick question. They received an exemption, but yet, if I heard you right, because it made me feel better, th that water with any sulfates or whatever from washing the boats is going to be captured, mm -hmm. not put into the sewer system or? That's right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and there will be like a, a grease trap type system, I believe. Like I say, the engineer may be able to explain it better. But the, the system required by, by our utilities department when these things go in. Thank you. Okay, any other For questions? This. The sidewalk, I was a little confused on that. Um, so Pinellas County is redoing the road so they can't put a sidewalk in now because they might tear it up, is that correct? 
they will tear it up. Yeah. There currently is a requirement they do put one in, right? Yes. So then why would it say that if in five years they can re revisit and see if they need one? Because under the current code, they can't decide if they need it. It's a requirement, right? Yeah, and that's a part of the staff report I should have corrected. Um, Cause I, I, mean, I, I don't like how they're getting all these people. I, I prefer sidewalks. Yeah, they either have need it. to pay, put in the sidewalk, pay in lieu, or get a waiver. I believe we can ask the applicant, but I, leave, I believe they will uh, apply for the waiver. If they don't get that, then they'll either need to put in the sidewalk or pay in lieu before the building permit, before the site can be um, Is there a sidewalk given across a the street? Good question. I don't said think something so. about they're near residential. Um, I mean, if they're trying to make it look better, a sidewalk makes everything look a lot, it looks terrible right now. It's called government efficiency. You'll put in a sidewalk just for the county to come and tear it up. Well, like, and I understand that, but yeah. that's, that's already in here. But then yeah. it's like, but then after that, then it's like, now it's up to you, where currently it's not up to them. They so have to do it. So. I, actually, when I reviewed this, there's nothing that I could find in your code that allows you to delay it for those five years. Oh, so right. actually, the right. that first, that A alternative is, is removed. Okay. So you'd only be looking at B for condition three. Yeah, I think I put the corrected yeah. uh, resolution and conditions. <laughs> I just didn't change the That'd explanation. Be the board of adjustments. Right. Then would they have to go to the Board of Adjustments for that? Yes. Mm -hmm. if, and if no, I don't think there's a sidewalk across the street. Um, if, if you recall, no. I'm sorry. Sorry. I was going to say, if you recall, when they did Tarpon Avenue, DO, there's other DOT, and when the DOT was finished, and GTE or whatever, Verizon had to come in, tear up what, what uh, DOT had to do to place their lines, and then they finished, and then the city had to come back, tear back that up, dig it back up so they could put their water lines in. So, you know, it's... Well, I mean, whoever's paying for it, the residents, yeah. it's, you know, sidewalks yeah, are essential. And yeah. So I, 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 I agree with the sidewalk, <laughs> but, but I sure would want to pay for one just to have them come up, tear it up two years so the county can put their, their own in. It's a business. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, it Ryland sure. Homes, which is the adjacent residential on the other side, or it was Ryland, uh, it's since all built out but they got a waiver on their sidewalk because there was wetlands there and uh and uh so there is no sidewalk there there's no sidewalk along the other side uh of Antelope road as you go east from there until you get to my business and then there is sidewalk just in front of my business and then there's no other sidewalk anywhere let me say you drop your boat off and then you go and you make a phone call someone to come pick you up and then you know you're in the side of the road and people are just driving down i mean i just every everyone wants to beautify something until they have to do something <coughs> that benefits a little bit more than beyond themselves and then find a way to pay it it out and you know when you look on certain sides of the road you can tell the difference between like pasco and pinellas and it's a sidewalk makes things look nicer and I've seen these applicants come up to the Board of Adjustments like well, I'm worried someone's gonna sue me well you know that's just part of life I mean people are gonna fall wherever they are and that's just part of it right. but Definitely. you want to beautify something until you have to do something that technically helps somebody else and I don't know why we give people these waivers I just think it makes it look nicer but I have well, a question for staff. You're not giving them the waiver. Yeah, we're not giving well, them. Yeah. The waiver. <laughs> they can apply for it. Yeah. Well, who, yeah. Yeah. who is the waiver applied to? The board of adjustment. <laughs> Super. Thank you. Yeah, they have to And okay. you know, they're get they're so the county's got, you know, plans to do like a multimodal. I think they're going to try to do some biking facilities. I'm not sure what the plan is. I mean, it's it's a kind of a tight road, so it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. And they, but they we thought we were being, mm -hmm. trying to be a little bit proactive to not have a sidewalk go in that's going to get torn up. Mm -hmm. the, to and try they to, are looking at some significant changes. Yeah, uh, I think they are. So uh, yeah. trying to set an alignment that's safe is is difficult to do at this point. I just don't understand. Like, there's like, it's just such a small part of the thing, yet we have, it's like, three, we put two other uh, subcategories for it, and it's not even the main part, part of the project, just giving all these ways to get out of doing something. But. 
It's not as a, I guess it goes to the Board of Adjustments at this point, so it's mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for staff? All right, seeing none, would the applicant like to make a statement? I'm uh, John Steckel with MJ Stokes Consulting. I'm the owner's agent. Um, address is 7702 Cedarhurst Lane, Tampa, Florida, 33625. Um, and you've been sworn, correct? Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. So I don't really have a presentation, but I think there were a few questions that there's some value in uh, just kind of going through here. Um, I think first to the, the boat wash area, talking with staff, the utility department, that, that has to be covered to keep the rainwater out. The actual boat wash area is a depressed concrete curbed area. So the boat wash area is gonna be draining into that and it'll route through an oil water separator before entering the, sewer, the city sewer. So that, that covers the compliance with, you know, the runoff from the, the boats being cleaned. Um, <clears throat> I think there was that one, um, the stormwater exemption that covered just because of the reduction in impervious on the site. That was the environmental resource permit exemption. We also worked with staff for the stormwater to meet the city's code. Um, basically have a swale routing around the property that captures the runoff, uh, treats that for water quality. Uh, and then, you know, just to touch on the sidewalk, the big driver of whether we seek the waiver or fee in lieu ultimately is because of the construction project pending so to build 500 feet of sidewalk at fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a cost, plus the maintenance of traffic in that process, to be torn out in two years and to be paid for, is is a difficult thing to swallow. Where the project went back to TRC two or three times because we were trying to minimize the cost for what we're trying to do here, which, uh, as Pat had mentioned, um, basically the same use previously, just cleaned up significantly and code compliance. So um, we're also currently working with the county with the driveway permits. The sidewalk was mentioned by them as well as a requirement. And we were discussing with them about the waiver and the timing of the project. So right now, the reviewers of the driveway permit are communicating with the project managers for this corridor project. So that's, we're actively involved with that as well. And ultimately, if, if we decide not to seek the waiver, the fee and lieu is there so that, you know, we're not fighting it, it's just from a, a cost standpoint and even the safety during the construction for, for users of the roadway. And I think it's important also to notice, to note that immediately east of our property line, there's a bridge that's about six inches outside of the traveled way in each direction. So the sidewalk, even if it goes across the property, there's absolutely no one, nowhere for anyone to go, which is gonna be addressed in that corridor project. So again, just a little background on uh, whether we seek the waiver, uh, or the fee on that. Is that what else? If there's any other questions, we and that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing there is no members of the public here to comment on this item, uh, I guess we can close public comments also, and. Uh, I need a, a motion and second so the board can discuss further if necessary. Chair, I'll make a motion. I'd like to motion approval for application 23-68. And I'm just gonna do it in one fell swoop with all the special conditions. Now, I only see one application on my screen. Is this a twofer or is this a one for? This one, site Just plan. a one site for, plan. so I can say all staff conditions, the top and the second, as written, are included in my motion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do we have any discussion? I, I wanna just say one thing, because I, I drive back and forth past it many times a day, uh, since it's kind of on the other side of the street from my business, and in the last, year and a half or so it looks 20 times better than it ever has looked in the past so so it's already well on its way to being 
a, a much better thing than than what it was. Uh, anyway, uh, if there's no other discussion, can we have a roll call? Miss Swenson? Yes. Miss Early? Yes. Mr. Rockline? Yes. Ms. Francis? Yes. Mr. Bessie? Yes. Mr. Kuskudis? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. All right. That brings us to application 2307, ordinance 202402. This is the amendment to the land development code that, that we asked staff to put together to shorten the time allowable time period for development agreements. Uh, what the staff have a presentation? Yes, I believe this was uh, a discussion item at your last meeting, I think, um, that uh, you all had um, wanted to go forward, uh, ask the board to go forward with the change to development agreements, Article 6. And um, the board did uh, have a discussion with the planning director, Renee Vincent, um, and they have directed staff to go forward with the changes that you all recommended, basically on page two of the um, ordinance, the draft ordinance, um, amending the um, code to have the duration of a development agreement not exceed five years with one extension by mutual consent of a supermajority of the Board of Commissioners. Um, there was some discussion at the board about potentially even capping that at less than five years. Obviously, you can do that with an individual agreement. It's just, you know, it cannot exceed five years. Um, we uh, asked the Planners Advisory Committee of, uh, for Pinellas County that we sit on uh, as part of Forward Pinellas um, you can you can ask questions of of the other jurisdictions. We asked how long um, people uh, you know these different jurisdictions have as their term for a development agreement. We got four answers back, and this this was uh, what we got back. Um, as we've discussed before, of course, the state statutes limit is thirty years. So you can see a couple of jurisdictions go ahead and use that. Mm -hmm. Um, Oldsmar is at five years, so there's an example of one that uses the five-year term. But um, I think that was a question and just, you know, what do other jurisdictions do? So it's, it, there's a variety of, of um, terms that they use. So with that, uh, are there any questions and what would you like to recommend from the board? I think our, we vetted this pretty well and I think what our suggestion, regardless of what they do in the county, is five years and an extension with a supermajority uh, of, of a commissioner, I think uh, uh, gives any developer a, a reason to move forward or, you know, what do they say, crap or get off the pot? And, and, uh, um, and so, I, I, and, and if they wanted an extension, then they need to do a good job at convincing a majority, not a majority, but a supermajority of the commissioners that that uh, extension is justified. So I think we did a good job in, in crafting or, or, or making that that requirement. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree, and I, I think we had one really good example just a few years ago of why it needs to be five instead of 10. Are you ready for a motion, Chair? If nobody else wants to discuss. Chair, I'd like to motion that we uh, approve and all right. Approval hold, is hold the on. action. I do want to roll back just real quick on this because you guys have, um, an, basically it's an ordinance in front of you. So hold on, I, I'm going to read it by title. Even though it's a legislative item, still have to read it by title. And then... Um, so if I may be so bold, how come you didn't have to do that for the other ones that also came with the ordinance? Or were those just with resolutions? The res with the resolutions, because the way you do your resolutions is by, by development order. Okay. Um, 
to do that, you know, you can read it, but all the information on the development order is contained in what's being presented in in your presentations. Thank you. So it's a, it's a little bit different, um, <clears throat> but definitely on a straight legislative item, this you 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 want to do this. So hold on one second. Let me pull up the title. Okay. Ordinance 2024-02, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the City of Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances, Appendix A, Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code, Article 6, Development Agreements, Section 96.00, Authority and Requirements, Providing for Severability, Providing for Inclusion in the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, and Providing for the Effective Date of this Ordinance. Thank you. I'd like to motion approval of ordinance 20 dash, excuse me, 2024 dash 02 as carefully read by <clears throat> Ms. Cardish. And, and just for the record, there's no public hearing because there is no public here, so there's nobody to speak on it. Mm -hmm. And I will second that motion. Do we have any discussion? Can we have a roll call then? Ms. Swenson? Yes. Ms. Early? Yes. Mr. Rockline? Yes. Ms. Francis? Yes. Mr. Vesey? Yes. Mr. Kuskutis? Mr. Seaman? Yes. All right, that brings us to staff comments. Uh, no comments. I'm sorry. That brings us to board comments, comment. and board member Vesey has something he'd like to briefly share with us before we close. Um, and thank you for your patience. I know it's been a very long evening, but something serendipitous is happening right as we speak. And it, there's so many things that come in together in common. I thought it was worthy. I'll try and keep my comments really short. The thrust of it is I'm going to refer to something that's happening on Clostermann Road that I think needs to come in front of this board as a regular agenda item of some type. I don't know how to structure that. That's right. So here's here's. And the first, what it ties to is at the last meeting, <clears throat> Mr. Kuskudus uh, was concerned about uh, a property that's on Carlton Road that is, in fact, a preservation area by the county. Coincidentally, there is an adjacent property that is a undeveloped parcel, which is just south of that. And if I was magic, I'd walk over there and I'd plug in my screen because I've got the map up right now but mentally go there unless Pat is so fast or Allie over there can pop up there. Um, and it's under uh, city, of Tar if you do city of Tarpon Springs zoning map, you can do any zoning map and pop it in that bottom corner. So there's a undeveloped parcel. It's big. It's owned by the school district. It has been for about 20 or 25 years in their infinite wisdom. The school board decided about four or five years ago that they were just going to, sell this parcel. It is highly coveted as a development parcel. Fine. But currently it's owned by the school district. And currently, as soon as the neighbors found out, they formed a preservation uh, LLC or a board to try and save and purchase this property. This is not anything new. It's happened. It happens all the time. Mm. Now, this is on our periphery because it doesn't appear to be in Tarpon Springs, but it is on the west end of Klosterman Road, the preservation district, or the, the group is called West Klosterman Preservation. Um, uh, I happen to live on Klosterman Road. Now, here's some of the other unique things that are coming together. Two months ago, this board saw the last of the review of the comprehensive plan, which was Parks and Rec open. And I just spent part of this meeting reading that program. And literally every goal, objective, and policy <laughs> refers to this piece of land. It's the strangest thing in the world and if you were to read it. Now, I think that this board needs to look at that because it is like a choo-choo train way off in the distance that's coming at us. And this is our first opportunity to see something in live time way in the future that has to do with all these elements that we have been wrestling with over the last five years. The review of our comprehensive plan, parks and rec, preservation of green space, 
needing some of our stuff, annexations. Now, you'd say, Justin, it's part of the county. What does this have to do with us? Well, what it has to do with us is that if we don't act, or I'm not sure what we would do, and if it is not preserved and it is sold, we are gonna see that developer right there asking or being told that they have to annex to the city because to the west is city of Tarpon Springs, to the east yep. is the city of Tarpon Springs, and to the north is the city of Tarpon Springs. It is already the city of Tarpon Springs. It just hasn't been formally annexed. So I would just encourage you all to do your own homework on any way you want. It's called wkpreserve.com. There it is. I would like to ask the chair of this board to, in an appropriate way, and that includes our council, Ms. Kardash, that we can bring this up as a regular agenda discussion item, just almost as a workshop item to look at it more carefully because we are gonna see it again, but this is our opportunity to get way out in front, whatever that might be. Okay, with that, I know it's been a long night. Um, I don't know if they were pointing or she was trying to pull it in. It's, I, it's the, an amazing the, piece of green. And then if anybody else would like to tail and make I, a comment, please. I do, I do, because you know the, the thing is, and, and, and I appreciate that, because one of the things that, that we have to be is proactive and plan, okay, and anticipate what the future is going to hold of this committee. We don't have a mission statement, but we kind of do know what our mission statement is, and it's a difficult balance on this board to, to progress is inevitable, but to have the progress and growth that make Tarpet Springs unique as a community and, and, and still maintain its uniqueness. I will tell you as I'm sitting here that everybody I talk to who's moved into this town that have come across the front of my desk, I ask the same question, why Tarpet Springs? Why did you just move here? There's any places in Florida to move. Why did you pick Tarpon Springs? And almost verbatim, they say, because we love, the, we love the character of this town. We love the charm of this town. Please don't lose your charm. Please don't lose what you have, because they've seen it, you've seen it happen in other places. And um, what, I don't know what we could do as being proactive board members to anticipate, you know, especially enclaves or, or, or things that we know that are coming are gonna come across us as far as, annexation because that's been a hot topic for us uh, you know to some degree our hands may be tied um and i think we that's been mentioned that our hands are tied in that regard um unless there is uh, a county overlay that that's consistent with what our our you know future land use is um but but uh, i appreciate you being uh, bringing that forward i've got a comment um as far as two parts, people coming to the town and they say that it's because of, what do you expect them to say? <laughs> They're all gonna, no, I'm not asking for an answer. They're all gonna no, say that. They, they no, all, we, they, I, I know that, but a lot of people are coming here for lots of other reasons and it's to make money. No. And of course they're going to say that. Um, you know, it's, we have to do our due diligence and look look people up. I do not take anybody at their word for why they're coming here. There's lots of reasons why they're coming here. They didn't find us by accident. It's been years in the, in the planning. The second thing is I have no problem with, with doing this, but we need to focus on what is in our city first. I have been asking for weeks to go over the smart code and I am at my wits end. And Pat, I've called you last week and this week. I mentioned it at the Greek Heritage. I mentioned it in a meeting here and at a workshop. We are worried, we cannot worry about what's outside of our city until we do work from the inside out. We have the two most important districts, downtown and the sponge docks, and we, we cannot do the entire comprehensive plan and just ignore the smart code. And I will not say, I I'm going to email the Board of Commissioners tomorrow until it gets on our agenda. I am done, I know that there are plans in the making. I know that's why it's delayed. I know it's why this went through. I know that there's other things coming through and you're just like, well, you know, and I, I'm not gonna, you know, there's no conspiracies. I know how things work and people wanna get their stuff through before that even comes up. But for Renee to mention it at that meeting and then to just, pretend that I haven't been asking for this and we cannot be stepping outside of our city until we deal with what is inside of it first. And the smart code 
is too important. It is, you know, what affects the city. Of course it does. Just as I mentioned tonight, right, a block outside of the smart code, we're going to act like one doesn't affect the other, and yet we're going to be worrying about something that's not even in our city. You know, and I'm, I'm glad that we're looking forward, but we need to protect what's inside of our city and what we can actually manage first. And I've been asking for this for almost six months at least. Mm -hmm. So I have nothing against that, but we, we have to deal with what we can first and what is right in front of us. And the smart code needs to be fixed. I don't, I don't even think we, we should have ever had it in the first place. I know we can't get rid of it, so we need to fix it. And it, it means different things for different areas. It should be more constrictive for the sponge docks. I don't care, whatever downtown wants, they can, we can talk with them and have a workshop with them. But we cannot ignore that, that we just went through the whole comp plan and that so the same thing that happened with Cohatch can just happen to them again. What does that say to the downtown district? We just did the whole comp plan so that we can change, you know, for the betterment of our city, but we didn't touch you guys, you know, so it's gonna happen again, just good luck. Oh, but we're gonna worry about this preservation over here and what could happen. You know, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna stop on this. I'm gonna continue to ask every meeting until it's on our agenda. That's it. All right, anybody else have any board comments? The only, the only other thing I would say is what we just did with regard to the, uh, uh, the, the development extensions here you may see that the uh, other communities in the county mirror what we just did, mm -hmm. what we just voted on five years with the supermajority. Well said, and thank you. <clears throat> thank you staff for listening to us and we've been talking about that and working on that together. Thank you very much. Yes, we appreciate that. A, a quick response to what we ask. Thank you. Thank you. And we stand adjourned at 943.